there's gonna be things in your life that you don't have control over. Human beings can control a lot more than they think they can. And oftentimes it's pretty easy just to say, oh, that's not me, that's not on me. And people say, that's not my fault. There's nothing I can do about that. And more often than people think, there is something you can do about it. And it is your fault. Jocko Willink, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. You flew to watch the UFC with Cam Haynes and Chris Pratt. I want to know what a night out with Jocko Willink looks like. Well, actually, I didn't fly up there with Cam. Cam was already up there. I think he flew in from Oregon where he is, where he lives. But we did, we did meet up there. And, but I did fly up there with Chris Pratt and Jack Carr and some of the other folks from the Terminal List, which is a TV show that Chris Pratt is in, that Jack Carr wrote the book that the show is based on. And we went up there, watched the fights. It was, it was a very cool night. Yeah, it was fun. What time did you get up the next day? I got up, I don't know, but Cam was giving me a hard time. He says, what, you know, what are you, are you going to get up tomorrow morning? And I said, I'm not even going to get home until three in the morning. And that's, what I, that's when I got home. I got home at three o'clock in the morning. I think I got up around maybe eight, eight thirty, something like that. The fact that you don't do the 4.30 a.m. thing after a night out makes me feel at least a little bit more mortal. If it's going to be less than four hours of sleep, then I'll make some kind of adjustment. You'll just push it the next day? Yeah. What was it like to see the UFC live? Have you seen that before? I've been to so many UFCs. I don't, okay. I don't know how many UFCs okay. I've been to, but I've been to a lot. I spe- I, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time coaching and training fighters. So I'd corner, I've cornered a bunch of fighters in the UFC. And so I've been to, uh, I don't even know how many UFCs I've been to. But I haven't been in a long time. I haven't been in probably three, four years so it was cool to go and see one again and, and get back up there. UFC, seeing the UFC live is, is awesome. And look, you know, people will say, and even I'll say this too, it's great to sit at home and, you know, get all the different angles and hear the commentary. That, that's cool. There's, there's a benefit to that. But there is a lot of, a lot of hype and a lot of energy that, that's in the room or in the, in the stadium when it's going on. And so being there live definitely, definitely is, is, is worth doing occasionally to make sure you don't forget what, that, what that's all about. How do you handle the next day now if you've had a few drinks the night before? I actually don't drink. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really no factor for me. You know, I, I, drank a, I drank more than my fair share when, when I was in the military. And then when I retired from the military and I kind of just over time, over over time, I just kind of wasn't drinking anymore. Now I just don't really drink anymore. There's not much in it for me. You know, I'm, a, I'm an old man with, I'm married with kids and businesses and all this other stuff going on. So I'm not going to get much out of, out of drinking anymore. And a big price to pay the next day as well, if you did decide to do it, maybe. I guess, I, I, sure, I guess that, that might be some of it, but there's just, I just don't, I'm not getting anything out of it. So two of the biggest elements in your life have been your military training and your martial arts training. What would you say are the commonalities between the best BJJ athletes and the best special forces operators that you've worked with? There's uh, probably the, the, the biggest commonality between the two is some kind of strange contrast between being extremely disciplined and being extremely creative. So clearly, if you're going to get good at jujitsu, you got to be the you got to be disciplined enough to train all the time. Same thing with being in the military. If you're going to be a good operator, you have to have the discipline to push yourself in training. But you can't be a person that you know leans so hard towards a disciplined, structured life that you don't have any creativity. Because both in jujitsu and on the battlefield, you want to you definitely want to have be creative and figure out creative solutions and things that people haven't thought of and things that the enemy is not going to think of or that your opponent's not going to think of. So you got to find that person who has a good balance between discipline and kind of a wild freedom creativity that they can make adjustments. It's interesting to think that more focus or more efficiency isn't always the solution to everything. So I, I, the analogy I'd use is, if you think about an artist's uh, creative studio where they need their creativity, it's not orderly. You know, there's half coffees and easels and sketches and paint and all sorts of stuff all over it. What does that engender? What's that environment creating for them? 
But then when they need to go and file their taxes, trying to file their taxes in that same room is pro probably not a good idea. And I guess that flip-flop between off and on, right, between focus and play, it seems like a very interesting thing to think about, especially in a military context. What, what, what does that mean when you're talking about a special forces operator being creative? You know, there's a certain level of inside the military in general is if you're going to, you have to be a person that kind of follows the rules and stays within standards and that's great. And you're going to, you're going to be a good solid soldier <laughs> if that's what you are. But if you have a mindset that's that's so highly disciplined and so highly structured like i just said then you're not going to think creatively when there's a problem that needs to be solved so you want to have people that don't mind the discipline and can actually access the dis discipline in a way that they can utilize it but you don't want people to be trapped by discipline and and it's the same thing in jujitsu if you have someone that only knows how to do a certain move and they can't think creatively about other ways to employ that. It's not that they're not going to be good because they are going to be good, but there's going to they're they're going to reach limitations. And you know, it's one of the interesting things in the SEAL teams is we didn't have, especially when I was coming up, we didn't have any doctrine whatsoever. There was no there was no written doctrine of any kind. So everything that you learned was word of mouth. You learned from the guys that went before you, and that meant if the guys that went before you weren't didn't really know what they were doing, you're probably learning a bad way. And if you didn't think, if you didn't think objectively about it, then you might follow someone down a path that doesn't make any sense. So you ended up with a bunch of guys in the SEAL teams that were pretty open-minded and they could kind of look at problems and figure out how to solve them. In the Army and the Marine Corps, they have doct doctrine for just about everything. This is how you do a raid. This is how you conduct an ambush. They had written doctrine for this. So if you didn't know how, you could just look at a book which is actually a huge benefit for them because if I'm a new platoon commander and I don't, how to, don't know how to do an ambush, I can just look at this book and I can learn how to do it. And so there's some huge benefits to, not, to, to having a very disciplined doctrine that you can follow. But that's one of the odd advantages of the SEAL teams is that since we didn't have any doctrine, we had to be a little bit more free thinking and that made us a little bit more adaptive in, in some situations. So it's just like anything else. Your strength can be your weakness. Your weakness can be your strength. And you have to be aware. And if you're aware that it's a strength, and if you're aware that it can also be a weakness, and if you're aware that it's a weakness, and you're aware that it can also be a strength, then you can probably optimize the way that you're going to think, which is pretty beneficial. Do you think that can be trained, that creativity? Yeah, I think creativity can be trained. It, it, just like any other natural trait some people are going to have more propensity to be creative than someone else and some people are more rigid than other people in the way they think and you can take someone that's more rigid and you can make them more creative but everyone's going to have some kind of a limitation and some people might have a pretty 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 subdued limitation of how creative they're going to get and some people can really be trained to get a lot better at that where did you fall on that spectrum I would say, say I fell, I, I would say I fell pretty hard in both directions. So I, I, I was, you know, a disciplined person that believed in structure and I liked structure. And at the same time, you know, I was, I, I, I would definitely think of things in a different way. And I, I was a very rebellious kid. And I think rebellion could be somehow tied to creativity and looking at things and, and saying, hey, that doesn't make sense to me. So I, I'd say that I had a, I'd say I was pretty, a pretty strong degree of both of those things. And that's what made me who I am. Well, especially the music that you listen to as well growing up, right? I don't think almost all of the kids that I know that grow up listening to metal or hardcore, they've, you can't listen to that and not have a rebellious streak in you. Yeah. You definitely can't listen to that and not have a rebellious streak in you. And that, that's, that, that did kind of drive my way of thinking a lot when I was growing up. And, and not only did it drive my way of thinking, I think I found that kind of music because that's the way I was sort of engineered in the first place. So, yeah. Who were you listening to when you grew up? Bad Brains, Black Flag, Agnostic Front, Crow Mags. Black Sabbath is my favorite band of all time. Yeah, those kind of bands. A lot of your work is 
it, it's focused on encouraging people to take ownership and responsibility for things. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot recently is whether it's possible to take too much responsibility or too much ownership, where you start to believe that you're at fault or you're accountable for things and blame yourself too frequently, blame yourself too much. Do you think that's possible? There's a way that it can happen, usually from a leadership perspective, when people ask me this question, hey, Kent, is it possible to take too much ownership? The answer is yes. And that is if I'm in charge and you're working for me and I take so much ownership over a mission or over a project that you don't feel like you have any input at all, then I've taken too much ownership. As far as, as, like, as an individual person, there's going to be things in your life that you don't have control over. And uh, you know, one, of the, one of the early questions that I got asked about this you know, like for instance, someone gets a terrible disease and, you know, or their kids gets a, gets a terrible disease, a, a, a random disease that's at, through no fault of anyone, the kid gets sick or the person gets sick. And no, there's nothing you can do about that. What you can take ownership though is how you respond to that situation. And so that's what you have to do. There's things that you can control. There's things you can't control. Now I will tell you that human beings can control a lot more than they think they can. And oftentimes it's pretty easy just to say, oh, that's not me, that's not on me. And I think that's, that's the whole genesis of the idea of extreme ownership is most of the time, or much of the time, people say that's not my fault, there's nothing I can do about that. And more often than people think, there is something you can do about it. And, you can, and it is your fault. I, I find it interesting to think about, uh, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility as well. And, and how that sits in amongst this. My concern with it is, I, I, don't get me wrong, I think that right now, the vast majority of people need to take more responsibility. I think that it is a great counter to a victim mindset. I think that it helps people with agency and sovereignty. I can see elements in my life though, of times when I've blamed myself for things which I'm in no way even remotely associated with. So for instance, let's say that I'm doing a podcast with someone or, or, or I'm doing a live event, right? And I'm facilitating some discussion and I ask a question and the guest fluffs the response, like gives a, a poor response. A lot of the time, the first place that I would go is that was on me. Somehow I should have asked a better question. And even if I'd asked the absolute perfect question and you could roll that forward into a relationship, you know, that you're in a relationship with a bad partner or you, something, something occurs. I just, I'm trying to find that line of how people can balance it so that they don't end up putting so much pressure and weight on them that it crushes them. Yeah. Well, here's two examples of what you're talking about. You, you mentioned one relationship. Another one is just if you're working for me. So if you're working for me and you don't show up on time or you're not professional when you're conducting your briefs. I need to say something to you and I need to take ownership of the fact that I haven't made it clear that, hey, you need to show up on time and hey, you need to be more professional and hey, you need to wear the right uniform or, or the, dress the part. I need to take ownership of that. And maybe if I do and I talk to you and we discuss why it's important and you say, oh yeah, I really didn't think about that and you change your ways and you get on board and you start showing up on time, you start acting more professional, it's great, we solve the problem. There's also a chance that you're late again or you show up, you know, with, with booze on your breath or whatever and we're meeting with a client and I say, hey, Chris, you can't do this. This is, look, I'm serious. You cannot act this way. This reflects bad on all of us and maybe you, and I might even say, listen, if you keep this up, you're not even going to be working here anymore. I'm going to have to get rid of you. You say, oh, no, I, do, I love working with you. It's going to be great. I won't do it again and maybe that solves your problem or maybe you're late again or you continue to act unprofessionally and then I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to say, hey, Chris, look, I talked to you. I, I tried to explain this to you. And at a certain point, I, this job isn't for you. So that can happen. And I, I have to take ownership of the fact that you are actually not capable of doing this job that I've asked you. So that's fine. Same thing can happen in a relationship, right? Look, if you're in a relationship with someone and you're bickering about where we're going to go for dinner or you came home late from work and all you do is, well, I've been working all day. You should respect the fact that I've been working on it. Like that's, that's actually on you. That's actually on you. And you can make adjustments to that. Now, can you get to a point in a relationship where the other person is not a good fit for you? 
And at some point you say, you know what? I've made these adjustments. I've come home, you know, on time. I've, I've texted you when I was going to be late. And these, these other things are coming up. And you say, you know what? I don't think this is working. And I don't think this is a good relationship. So at a certain point, you say, okay, I've made the adjustments that I can make. And I have to take ownership of the fact that we're not a good match. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of times where taking ownership means actually solving the problem, not continuing to, to pour the problem down your neck every night because that's not very helpful to anybody. So yes, at a certain point, you have to, you have to make adjustments and you have to move forward. There's a lot of similarities, I think, between your personal philosophy and Jordan Peterson's. I know you've spoken to him a couple of times. What have you learned from him? Well, the, the most interesting thing that I learned from Jordan Peterson, and I mentioned this the first time he came on my podcast, was that you know, he's a trained academic that studied this stuff his whole life, and we came to a lot of the same conclusions about things. And I just came to those conclusions through living and the, the experiences that I had, and he came to them through studying this stuff in a very rigorous way. And, and the cool thing is, luckily for me, I had written books that sort of predated. Uh, I got there first. Yeah. I got there first. It wasn't that I got there first, but I mean, I, this, these were the thoughts that I had. I mean, Discipline Equals Freedom. That book came out, I think, before, I, before Jordan Peterson was on the scene. It's the book Extreme Ownership, which is about taking personal responsibility. Well, it's about taking responsibility, and you can definitely apply it to personal responsibility. So luckily for me, those, those books kind of predated uh, Jordan Peterson coming onto the scene and, and doing everything that he did. But again, it's not like I created any of those things. It's not like I created it before he created it. And it's not like he created it before other philosophers had figured these things out. So I'd say that the most interesting thing about Jordan Peterson that I, that I found, and I think it was pretty interesting to him too, was the fact that we both had kind of come to these same conclusions and we had lived very different lives. I mean, I'm sure there's more disparate lives that we could live, but they're, they're pretty different lives. And that's, that was a very interesting thing. And it, it made me feel like, well, it made me feel good about the fact that the things that I had figured out were in line with things that he had figured out. And that means maybe there's a little bit more strength and universality to these things that I believed, which, which felt pretty good. I was going to pause that. Do you want to go and see if there's someone stealing things outside? <laughs> If there's someone stealing things, can you let me know? It looks like they're bringing things in. That's the opposite. It's nice to know or to think that something that's been proven in the field of battle or on the field of play is backed up in academia, right? That someone can go through the annals of philosophy history and come to a similar conclusion as you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And... You know, the stuff, the stuff that I say is in the Bible, the stuff that I say is in Stoicism. And, and Jordan Peterson, you know, says the stuff that I say or I say the stuff that he says. Again, I'm not trying to compete with Jordan Peterson on any level, uh, especially some kind of an intellectual level. But we have similar thoughts about things and that predated either one of us knowing who each other were. So I think that's pretty cool. Why do you think people are drawn to advice that's telling them to do hard things? Kind of seems counterintuitive. Why do I think people are drawn to advice telling them to do hard things? Because I think pe any person, any human realizes that if you want some kind of a good outcome, you're going to have to work hard for it. <laughs> and if you and if you don't work hard for something, you're not going to get an outcome that's really worth much. Well, that is the thing that separates the achievements on the other side of it, right? If it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, everyone would achieve it. So th this is one of the things that I, I try and rely on when training has been getting hard. So I ruptured my Achilles a couple of years ago. That sucked. I wouldn't advise it as, a, as an injury generally. Yeah, and it's like a random... You'd a lot of times of people nowhere. just do it, you know, getting out of their car or something. Dude, I was playing cricket. Yeah, the most British go. way to snap an That's Achilles. That's a very British way to snap your Achilles for sure. Um, <laughs> during that, during the rehab for that, it's pretty just uncomfortable. It's endless calf raises, right? Which is not fun. And 
the discomfort that you feel and the the, pain, the um, fear of it re rupturing, which is the number one thing you don't want it to, to have happen. The thing that I went back to in my mind was, this is why I'm here. The discomfort that I was feeling, the um, effort, the pain, the sweat. Thankfully, this was during COVID. So it meant that if I had to do a workout every single morning for half an hour on just my calves, it's like, what else are you doing, right? There's a pandemic going on. Um, this is why you're here was the reminder. It's like, look, this is the reason why the re-rupture rate is uh, 5 to 10%, because people don't want to do this thing. People don't want to do the thing because it hurts, because it takes half an hour every single day for nearly 12 months. It's a full 12-month recovery. That's why. This is why you're here. And I think that you're right. I think that the selection is people deep down know that picking up heavy things physically, psychologically, existentially, culturally is good for us and i think that that's why it's attractive i agree another thing that i think is that it's one of the reasons why people can become a little bit triggered triggered they can become a little bit uncomfortable when they see somebody else that's got a lot of discipline because i think deep down they know that if they had that thing that that would fix a lot of the problems that they have in their life is this is this a dynamic that you that you've seen I'm sure that's a, a bummer for someone to look at someone else that's working really hard and and achieving some positive things and they know that they're not maybe working as hard as they could be and they're not really achieving what they want to achieve. I'm sure that stings a little bit. Another thing that Jordan said recently is that the problem with Twitter is that the price of being a prick has fallen to zero. I feel like you'd agree with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'd agree with that. If you're going to spend a bunch of time on Twitter, you're going to, you're going to run into a bunch of people that don't like you and they're going to say it and there's nothing you can do about it. So. And the ability for people's words and the consequences of those words to become detached as well is something that's only pretty recent. I mean, I mean, I guess you could have sent a mean telegram a hundred years ago. Yeah. I would recommend that you don't let random bots or people on Twitter bother you that much. That's that's my recommendation. I, I would recommend you. To, I, you know, the first time I kind of experienced that, it was when I was on I was on Rogan for the first time, and the YouTube video came out, and I sat there with my oldest daughter, who was probably maybe fourteen or fifteen at the time, and. I sat there and read these <laughs> heinous comments about me and laughed. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, what, what, it, it was kind of, you know, some were pretty good. It was kind of funny. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not getting bothered by somebody that wants to talk smack about me for whatever on Twitter. And also there's, there's probably some truth to whatever they're saying. You know, they say I'm a big knuckle dragger. Yeah, probably right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they say I'm an idiot. Yeah, there's definitely some of that. What else? <laughs> Do you swear much? I don't think I've ever heard you swear. I, I don't swear a ton. Um, and look, when I there's a there's a term we have in America. I don't know if you have this in in England, but swear like a sailor, meaning people in the navy swear a lot. Yep. And certainly, when I was in the SEAL teams, I probably swore every seventh, fifth to seventh <laughs> word that came out of my mouth, especially talking to a SEAL platoon about something. But no one. I don't, I don't swear a ton. I mean, if you listen to my podcast all the time, you'll see that when there's an appropriate time to swear, then I will. But even it's interesting, you know, if you swear all the time, it kind of loses its impact. And so when I do swear on the podcast, people usually say, Oh, he's, this is, this is an important he thing. Or business. this is a, this is obviously very, very, uh, powerful emotion that he's feeling around. Cause he just said a swear word. So yeah, but I don't swear a ton when I'm, and even when I was in the SEAL teams, I'd come home at night and wouldn't swear. I don't swear in front of my wife and I wouldn't swear in front of my kids. So I would just turn it off and that's that. It's like when you hear Sam Harris swear, if you ever hear him do yeah, it, it's yeah. sprinkled very infrequently, yeah. but when it happens, you, you were okay. Yeah, this, it's an attention getter. Yeah. I have a friend, Daniel Sloss, a uh, comedian uh, and Scottish. So that combined is like a multiplying force and, um, I actually think that he probably uses more swear words than actual words. So just <laughs> that Salt Bay guy, it's kind of like that, but just yeah. throughout every single sentence. Deprogramming it, I think, is important. It's something that I've really tried to work on. 
you know, just being a, a working class lad from the UK is it's part and parcel of the language perhaps is being in the seals listening back and, and especially hearing yourself speak a lot which you've done over the last six seven years or whatever i don't know there's something about it that i i just i, w- I would rather save it for the times when i need it yeah and there is if you're doing something like where people are going to listen to it sort of detached from the moment that yes. you're living yes. in then it's different as well. So it doesn't have this, it doesn't come across the same. And you and I having a conversation over lunch, talking about whatever, that, that's different. And, you know, the, those, those words are a little bit more fitting in those situations. But, or if you're watching the UFC. Yeah, if you're watching the <laughs> UFC. But, yeah. yeah. I, 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 look, I don't really, if people swear, it's not, it's not like a huge concern of mine. <laughs> I don't really care that much. But, maybe you could improve your vocabulary a little bit and use to not always rely on the right. same five swear words. <laughs> yeah. But some people use them well and they're hilarious when they use them. Daniel, so. Daniel uses his spectacularly. Yeah. So I would say go. he's probably got a black belt in, in swearing. Right on. I want to revisit your good video for the people that haven't seen it. It's a two minute long edit that was released seven years ago on your YouTube channel and it's got like nearly 10 million plays or something now. And in it, you're encouraging people to respond to setbacks and things that don't go well by saying good, by uh, leaning into the discomfort, by seeing it as an opportunity. Was there anything you think that people misinterpreted about that video or about good generally as a concept? Look, look, if you take any idea and you take it to an extreme, then that idea is going to become bad. I mean, e- even the idea of extreme ownership, if you take it to an extreme where you're, like, as you pointed out earlier, you're blaming yourself because your daughter got a, a, a disease or you're blaming yourself because your husband is abusing you. Like th- there's a point where you, s- you think anything go too far and well, well you know, I mean, there's there's some pretty good memes about that on some the internet. Phenomenal yeah, memes. there's some good memes about that on the internet. Oh, crashed my car, my dog died. Good, I needed a new car anyways. So yeah, take it to an extreme. It can be it be, can become pretty silly or funny depending on how you take it. But for the most part, you're gonna run into challenges in life, and if you curl up into a ball and complain about it, that's not gonna help you. And if you say, okay, cool, good. Here's some adjustments I can make to move forward. That's going to be a better move than, than cowering. Is there anything that you wish that you'd added in? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I said it during one of my podcasts and my friend Echo turned it into a video. So, so that's it. If I wanted to, I probably would have expanded on it or done something else. Um, I don't know. Do you tell me? Did I miss something? I don't think so. I mean, it's pithy, and and obviously one of as you've said there, it's extensive, not exhaustive, as a solution. And this is this is Twitter in a nutshell. That you have to sacrifice um, how explicit you're being for brevity, right? For, for it being sufficiently succinct that people can understand it, and you can get it in in a one minute fifty five, so that people can actually watch it and won't click off or whatever. And people will then use the uh, lack of detail to expand that out and say, yeah, the dog died in the car <laughs> crash and good, right? You, you can see how that's easy to criticize. But I, I think overall, there's this really great story, actually. It was about Zeno of Citium, the guy that uh, founded Stoicism. And uh, often he was criticized that he was very abrupt when he would speak to people, when he was giving uh, his... Because he, he was around in a time of the sophists, right? And the sophistry was all about these big, long, extravagant um, philosophical treaties, and they would use these super, super long words and stuff. And what he found was that people didn't like the fact of how abrupt he was. Didn't like that. And someone once criticized him for it, and he said, uh, yes, I am. Thank you. If I could, I would even shorten the syllables as well. And I, I like the idea of someone that uses brevity in an effective way. And uh, it, it, this sort of links in with something that I've been thinking about recently, which is to do with the outcomes that we get in life. So 
all of the concerns that we have, all of the sleepless nights and the neuroses and the overthinking and the confusion and the uncertainty and the self-doubt and all of that stuff, all combined together, I think probably net us about maybe five or 10% better outcomes in life. It's my belief that most of the qualities that you have, your integrity, your virtue, your discipline, your hard work, your growth mindedness, your humor, your resilience, all of that are forces that are very, very difficult for you to slow down. And that once they've got started, it's incredibly hard for you to stop them. And what you're doing with all of the extra concern that comes over the top of that is just making your day-to-day -day experience of it a lot more miserable. And I, I've been thinking a lot about how can you, how can you, Amor Fati, right? The love of fate, the love of the, the destiny that I have is the one that's going to come. I understand that I have control over it. I understand that I have agency, that I have sovereignty, that I can impact my destiny. But also that all of the work and the effort that I put in previously is going to carry me through. And if I've been successful so far, that worrying about success going forward, whether or not it's going to occur, just it, it, it doesn't seem super smart. And then relating that to good is that not only do you need to, or can you accept something and say that it is good, you can also have the sense of resiliency that you know that you've got through something that's worse than this before. How did you get on last time? That you faced something that was difficult? But you're still here. By virtue of the fact that you're listening to this, you're still here. And there's a part of that that makes me, uh, makes me think about, good is an active philosophy, right? It's ac actively saying something happens, I'm going to lean into it. I'm going to be um, uh, forward motion, right? And then the backup that you seem to have behind that as well is, look at all of the things that I've dealt with before. Look at all of the effectiveness that I've come through with previously. And I think that those two combined together are pretty powerful. I agree. Speaking about, uh, speaking about motivation and stuff as well, which is obviously kind of the other side of, of what you do. You know why I'm laughing, right? Why? Because you were telling the story about this guy who gave really brief answers, and then you talked for six minutes, mm -hmm. and I said, I agree. So it's just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. You and Zeno have got a lot in common. Yeah, maybe. Do you think that people overcomplicate motivation? Yes. I find that discussions about motivation a lot of the time, I mean, you are the uh, soundtrack to a lot of motivation compilation uh, videos. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, motivation universe, 40 minute, <laughs> get up and get after it, Jocko video. Um, and so I, I think that a lot of the discussions about motivation can cause people to believe that there's some magical state that they need to be in before they do something. Yeah, and as I've said since day one, it's motivation is a feeling that comes and goes, and it doesn't matter whether it's there or not. Discipline is infinitely more important. So no matter how you feel, get up and do what you're supposed to do. That's it, and that's discipline. It's not motivation. If you only did what you were supposed to do when you were motivated to do it, that's leaving it to chance. But if you're disciplined, you go do what you're supposed to do. That's the way it works. I went and listened to an episode you did with Sam Harris seven years ago now, long time ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he came up with this really interesting idea where he said that you can't fake courage. Yeah. That's one of the most interesting ways to look at it. He said that courage or bravery, I think is actually what he was uh, talking about, you, it's an emotion that you can't fake. If you fake bravery when you're terrified, that is bravery. And I kind of feel like motivation is the same thing. If you do the thing when you're feeling unmotivated, that is motivation. That's it. <laughs> so are you saying that all of the Jocko videos of motivation, they can just go off of YouTube? Well, I, I, I say in a lot of those videos. And sometimes that's what it takes for people to get motivated is to realize that that motivation they don't doesn't need the matter. Motivation after it doesn't all. matter. It's a self-defeating video. Like, just shut up and go do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean the difference between the person that spends all day wondering about whether they should go to the gym or not <laughs> and the person that just goes to the gym or not, even if they both go, it, it, they net out at zero apart from the fact that one person has spent the entire day obsessing over it. 
Yeah, and probably wasting some brain power on it. <laughs> There's this thing called uh, the uh, I bro science called the anxiety cost. So you know opportunity cost, mm-hmm. right? That you because of doing one thing, you can't do another thing. Uh, anxiety cost to me is the wasted mental effort that you go through obsessing over something when you could fix it quite easily by just doing it. It's one of the most compelling reasons for doing a morning training workout for me. If you go to train every day, every morning when you wake up, your um, daily to-do list resets, right? You get out of bed and then your to-do list of meditate and walk the dog and answer emails and do all that. The sooner that you can front load that stuff, the rest of the day is just... Ah. Yeah, discipline equals freedom. That's it. I mean, if you have the discipline to get up and get the things done... Well, I, I've, I've usually, or I often tell a similar story. This is the same thing that you just said, which is, hey, you know the weekend where you really only had two things to do for the weekend, whatever it was, you had to write this thing and you had to answer this other thing. And on Friday, you're like, I'll do it tomorrow. And on Saturday, like, I'll do it. And it's basically hanging over your head the whole weekend. Whereas if you'd just done Friday afternoon, the whole weekend would have been a lot better. So just do the thing. I agree with you. Just do, just, just do, do the just thing. Just do the thing, man. What does courage mean to you? Is that a good definition from Sam? Do you think doing doing the thing in spite of the way that you feel? Yeah, I think that's I think that's solid. I, I, I somebody asked me a question the other day. Does courage have to involve risk? And I thought about it a little bit. I haven't thought. I, I don't sit around and think about a lot of stuff, uh, which might be obvious, I guess. But yeah, I think if you're gonna. If you're going to get credit for courage, then there has to be some level of risk, whether it's, you know, capital risk in doing something in a business or physical risk if you're doing something to run into a fire to save somebody. Yeah, so I think I think courage has to have some kind of risk involved. And then, yes, I agree with Sam Harris when he pointed out that if you're acting, if you're doing the thing, then that's courage, no matter how you feel inside your, your little brain. Are you sure that you don't spend that much time sat around thinking of stuff? Because I know that you you do a ton of prep for each of your podcast episodes. And as you're reading through a book, I mean, the insights that you pull out of that, that you drag across between you, I think you might be doing yourself a bit of a disservice there. Well, yes. When I'm reading a book, I'm certainly applying the context of my life and my experiences and what I know and what I think I know to that. So I guess... But, I, but that's different than sitting around and thinking. <laughs> oh, you mean like the, the sort of the chin yeah. stroking. Yeah. I don't do a lot of that. Maybe I should do more. I probably need to. I'd be interested to see that. I could see you sat in a smoking jacket somewhere, <laughs> cigar. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I, I think when I run, I think when I'm doing jujitsu. Surfing. Yeah, think when I'm surfing. And those are just... That's, that's a great kind of empty mind. And, and there's times where I'm running and I have to stop and write something down. Uh, you know, I'll pull out my, because I'll, I'll be listening to some music or something. I'll stop and take a note in, in my iPhone about something that I just thought of. So it happens. Courage is very hard to find when life gets comfortable for people. How can they stop their bravery from eroding when times are easy? I guess, I guess what we already talked about, do something that's hard and do it every day. That's what, that's one of the nice things about jujitsu. You're going to get choked. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to get smashed. You're going to have to tap out. Your ego is going to get abused. Your go do that. Go, go do that. You, you go for a run, lift, do, do, just do hard stuff. And that's a good way to keep that, I guess, fresh. You think that maps across? onto other areas of life as well. It certainly seems like it does, but there's no guarantee on any of this stuff. The really, <laughs> there's no guarantee. And it depends on what, you know, what kind of courage you're talking about. Are we talking about courage where you're going to die or you could possibly die? Or you, ta- you know, is that what we're calling courage? Cause there's people that have come from every walk of life that have stepped up in that situation. And there's people that have come from every walk of life and have failed in that situation. So if you're talking life or death, yeah, I, I mean, I think you actually have to get to someone that is sort of good with dying and they're okay with it. And then they're going to have a lot easier time pushing into that fold if it shows up. Have you seen those Detroit self-defense videos? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think, 
oh, I know I have. I'm trying to think how I saw them, but yeah, because a lot of jujitsu people will will repost those things. Yeah. What What do you think that people misunderstand when it comes to life and death fights, street fights? What do you think most normal people who haven't been in one misbelieve? <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with those Detroit videos. Those what? Detroit videos are definitely. Uh, it's a pantomime. Yeah. So I, I guess. So uh, I guess what, to, to answer your question, what do most people not understand about a street fight? Uh, they're probably not used to just the level of violence that's going to occur. They're not there. Maybe this is maybe this is what you're getting at with the Detroit uh self-defense videos or whatever they are the choreographed maneuvers that you that work when you and i are going through them and sort of dancing those aren't going to work in real life and so if you think that you're going to be able to drop someone with one punch or you think you're gonna be, all, all those things that 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 are sort of the old traditional martial arts doing kata and i you know i do this to you and it causes this reaction then my next move is over here yeah, that stuff doesn't really work in a street fight. Just, yeah. The groin kick and the palm of the hand to the nose to run away from the, the female to run away from the attacker and stuff like that. Yep, it's not going to work well. And it's not very reliable. If you want to learn how to fight, you got to learn how to fight. You know, you got to do jujitsu, Muay Thai, wrestling, boxing. That's what you need to do if you want to learn how to fight. Have you been to go and see what Tim Kennedy's doing up at, at his place with his self-defense courses? I have not been to one of his courses. It's called Sheepdog Response, but I've seen what he's doing. And of course, you know, Tim's, Tim's a, not only is he well-versed in martial arts, clearly, he's also well-versed in weapons and he's also well-versed in violence. And so I know what he's t teaching is legit stuff. I'm pretty sure they're using live handheld tasers as well during that to just show people precisely how difficult it is to whatever do the the, the face palm and the eye gouge and the, the fish hook and run away. And uh, I think he runs, I think it must be monthly. He does a special one for not military personnel, for um, the police. Mm -hmm. And um, even them, the amount of training, I think, I mean, we've seen this recently, right? That the training seems to be insufficient. Yeah, the training for police officers is totally insufficient. And it's, it's horrible because it's a very difficult job that you should be training. I, I've been saying for the last several years that police officers should train 20% of the time. 20% of the time that they work, they should be training. And right now, it's, not even, it's probably not even a measurable percentage of time that they're working. I mean, it's probably in the fractions of a percent that they're training. They're, they're, they get horrible training. And they're in really dynamic situations and in doing an incredibly hard job. You don't know how to do that stuff. You know, that's in the, you talked about the misconceptions of the street fight is the person that thinks, well, you know, when I, if someone messes with me, I'm just going to get wild. And they think that's going to work. And that's not going to work, especially against someone that's trained. So if you think that you're gonna have some magical powers because you're angry or because your adrenaline's going, that's not that's not true, and it's gonna it's gonna cost you in a big way. Especially if you come up against somebody like Tim Kennedy, who's genuinely trained. Oh, for sure, yeah. And and you know, this day and age, well, I mean, I live in San Diego, California. A lot of people train. A lot of people train. I wouldn't say it's the majority of people train, but there are a lot. If you get into a fight in San Diego, there's a decent chance you're fighting against someone that knows how to fight. And if you look, there's jujitsu on every street in San Diego, jujitsu academies. So, yeah, if you just think you're going to be a tough guy, <laughs> it's, it's going to be rough. It's going to be a rough tour. I saw a video the other day that you may have seen as well of Tim talking about changes he was making to his everyday carry. Mm -hmm. You see this? Uh, I, don't, so he's I don't think so. He was changing the uh, weapon that he was using, the pistol, um, because recently some of the active shooters have been using body armor. Mm -hmm. So he's now gone to a relatively small caliber, but a, a armor piercing round. Yep. Are you concerned about this increasing sophistication that seems to be coming from people that are shooters? Yeah, there's a little, there's an escalation there, right? But that's uh, the, the military went through this with, 
the people we were fighting. They start wearing body armor. Cool. Roger that. You want to wear body armor? We'll we'll get armor piercing rounds. You know, the, the, it, it's just a natural escalation of things, unfortunately, but it's the way it is. It's kind of like the predator-prey dynamic, right, of evolution. Yeah, yeah. The, the enemy's going to make adjustments and we're going to have to adjust back. What are your principles for an everyday? Are you allowed? Can you have an everyday carry in, in uh, San Diego? Yes. Right. What are your principles that you follow for, for that? The, the, the same as a normal person that wants to protect themselves. Well, we had this recent 4th of July shooting, right? And then before that, we had Uvalde. And then before that, we had Buffalo. Have you got any idea if this is the sort of thing that can be stopped or can be restricted in some way? Yeah, I did. I did some podcasts on these things and some of the the biggest or I would say one of the most startling things and uh, about as you watch the evolution of this. So in in 1955 in America, there was 340 inpatient beds for people with mental health issues per 100,000 people. So for every 100,000 people in America, there was 340 inpatient beds for those people, from people with mental health problems. In 2007, it was 17 beds per 100,000. So there, the, the mental health capacity for treatment in America is gone down in a, what, a 95%. And, the re- and there are some legitimate reasons why this happened. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that people were getting put in these institutions and the, there were some horrible abuses that were going on in some of these mental institutions, people being committed that didn't want to be in there, people that were abused once they were in there, people that could never get out of there. And there was a, a backlash against that. And it all of a sudden became in the 70s, hey, this, this mental health, these mental health facilities are evil, they're bad. There's abuse going on. We need to shut them down. And they shut down a lot of them. And so in doing that, it certainly appears to me that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And now we've got, I mean, you, you think San Diego, there's two or three million people here. There's a lot of people that need help, that need help, <laughs> mental health help. And there's just not a great place to get it. I, you know, I talk to police officers a lot. Police officers come upon people all the time that they don't need to get put in jail. They need to get put in some kind of a mental health facility, but they don't exist. And so they go into jail for a little while. They, they come back out and it's a problem. So, so if you take just the numbers of the beds, right? What has that done to all the other aspects of mental health? Like all, what about the outpatient people? How many doctors used to be ready to help somebody that was feeling depressed or was feeling angry? There probably were a lot more doctors back then that had the capability of treating those things. So we've, we've really shut down our capacity to help people from a mental health perspective. And then on top of that, we've added all these things into society that create more mental health problems, i.e. drugs, alcohol, social media, uh, the, the, the fact that someone can stay in their house all the time, but then we put COVID on people where they had to stay in their house all the time. They're getting stuck in echo chambers. There's all these things that add to mental health problems, and we've, we've really done away with a lot of the treatment that we had before. So uh, hopefully in, in the coming months and years, we can start to get back to a place where we start to build up our capacity for treating help people that have mental health issues because these these shooters in these scenarios they clearly are they have mental health problems well it's a trend as well that's dominated by young men it seems and that that seems especially sad because these are men that could be out working a job or starting a business or being in the armed forces contributing to something and instead they're off on a rampage somewhere it's horrible to see One of the differences we were talking before we started about the differences between the US and the UK, I've spent a lot of time late nights in city centers working nightclubs. And um, I've spent a lot of time around homeless people. At two in the morning, the only people that are out are club promoters and and homeless people and and party goers. And uh, the difference between homeless people in the UK and homeless people in the US 
is more stark than the difference between the cultures by distance. They are significantly more <clears throat> antsy, uh, uh, evidently um, in discomfort and and talking to themselves, shuffling along, uh, rocking backward and forward, um, much more forthcoming, significantly more forthcoming, significantly more aggressive, even though I've never had anything super bad happen. Uh, downtown San Diego, downtown Denver, downtown Austin. I haven't spent a ton of time in America, but I mean, there are a lot of them. And the safety net that we have in the UK to sweep up people who fall through the cracks like that is... It, it, it seems to work, right? You know, someone someone ends up in a really bad way mentally. Away you go. We'll pop you into a ward. You'll be looked after. We'll be given the medication that you need. There's no insurance that restricts that. But as you said earlier on, it's like a vicious cycle of the people who are the ones that are the most vulnerable are the ones that maybe get sent to jail, perhaps they get hooked on drugs. The drugs make their mental health conditions worse, which means that they can they further ingrain themselves into a life of either crime or homelessness, which takes them further away from a job and a balanced life. And yeah, I mean, it, it kind of doesn't surprise me, but it's it's pretty sad to see. Yeah, I'd be interested to know the numbers of of inpatient beds per hundred thousand in the UK, because if you think about the homeless people that you've seen in San Diego, and there's two million people here, right? There's a lot of those people that probably would be swept up and put into a place where they're getting the right mental health treatment that they need, and mental health treatment is not an easy thing to do. It can take an extended period of time to get someone sorted to a point where they're able to be go out and contribute to society. So yeah, I'd be interested to know those numbers. And even from what you're saying right now, my guess is England's probably doing a better job of getting people the help that they need. How long have you been married now? I think 25 years. And you met your wife in Bahrain, yep. right? You remember the story about the first thing that you said to her? Yes. Would you tell that? Uh, yeah. So w I was on a on a deployment in the Navy. I was on a ship. While we were on a ship, this is back before internet on ships, and we to occupy our time. When you're a SEAL on a ship, there's nothing to do. You don't have a job, so you just sleep, eat, and lift is our joke. And you can only sleep, eat, and lift so long. And then we we had a certain selection of movies on videotapes. And so one of the movies that we had was Ace Ventura, Pet Detective with Jim Carrey. And so we did a lot of imitating Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. And when I, so we eventually went to Bahrain. My, the other squad, there's two squads in the SEAL platoon. The other squad had actually gone to Bahrain before us. Squad two went to Bahrain for a few days. They were ahead of us. And we didn't know anything about Bahrain. We didn't know what was going on there. Because there's, again, there's no internet. You just know some going to some random place in the desert. And squad one had work to do, so we stayed on the boat for a couple extra days. And then when we finally flew to Bahrain, squad two was waiting for us, and they were they were saying, "Hey, this place is like there's good times to be had. There's bars and girls and the whole nine yards." And so they had like they were staged and ready to take us out. And yeah, we went to a bar, and I and I a big giant packed kind of club slash bar and, and I saw a tall beautiful blonde woman and actually actually one of my friends in squad two had said to me oh there's these two girls you're gonna be he's like I know you're gonna talk to him and he was kind of a shyer guy and I said oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll work out with you man you're you'll do fine and sure enough Walked in this bar, saw my saw my future wife, and I just I walked up to her and I said, in like a Jim Carrey tone, I said, uh, "Should I just call you Aphrodite's goddess of love?" And she looked at me like I was an idiot, which was accurate. And then you know I bought her a drink, and the rest, as they say, is history. How did you save that? I I, I want to know how you turned that opening line around. You know, it was I did it in a ridiculous enough way that she could say probably tell I wasn't taking myself too seriously. I mean, it it wasn't serious, right? So, if you're not being serious, she laughed and we were good. I didn't I didn't say it. I didn't say, "Should I just call you Aphrodite's <laughs> goddess of love?" No, if I would have said that, I probably wouldn't have ended up with her. But yeah. I was having fun. What have you learned since being married to a Brit? 
Is there anything that uh, you think has been a, a unique insight? You know, Britain, England, the UK, long allies with America, even though I guess originally it didn't start off that way, clearly. Look, the 4th of July was a very difficult day for me. <laughs> yeah. It was a very difficult day. Happy treason day to all of the ungrateful <laughs> colonialists. Uh, no, I, I, I love the historical aspects of England. Uh, you know, the, 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 the military that I've worked with, the Brits that I've worked with, kind of to me represent what I think of when I want, when I think of England and when I, the way I, the way I kind of hold England and the UK in an elevated way in my mind, the, the British military that I've worked with have maintained that standard, completely professional, stiff upper, upper lip, squared away, ready to work. And just, just, just the, the really just professional. And that's the way I always think of England. I'm interested here in the disciplining process of getting married and becoming a father because you were someone who had already worked hard on being disciplined, but this feels like a very different type of discipline to the discipline to uh, put up with a baby that won't stop crying. It's the uh, discipline to be able to comfort somebody while you're away from them. Um, that to me feels like a different sort of frequency of of discipline and uh, i'm interested in what you found as a challenge and what you found as um uh, whether your military career had uh, prepared you for marriage and and fatherhood effectively well first of all uh, uh insane amount of credit goes to my wife who is just she uh, well, one of the things i've exp tried to explain to people about her is that she was emotionally independent meaning she didn't need me to to bolster her up and w w she handled everything she handled everything on the home front literally everything and i would just go and go do my job and she never complained about that she never made any comments about it. It was, she knew kind of the priority for me was my job and that later on in life and, and that strategically in our lives, the, the priority was the family, but she also knew that while I was in the SEAL teams, that was my number one priority. And she knew that. And I told her that. And she said, yeah, I know. I get it. You take care of your team, you take care of your platoon, you take care of your task unit, and I got this. I got these kids and this house and all that other stuff. And she never complained. She never, she just, she just did it. And so the, the majority, the vast majority of credit goes to my wife for being an awesome human being, an awesome uh, mom to our kids. And I was, I would love to give you some kind of, this is what you need to look for. And, and I, that's probably the best I could do, but I can't say that I looked for it. I, I got very, very lucky. I, I got very lucky in that my wife was, was, look, you can judge her looks, and I obviously she was and is a beautiful woman, but the luck part was she was, like I said, emotionally independent. She was uh, strong to be able to handle just just mayhem mayhem on a pretty regular basis you know not you know from from having a bunch of kids to i'm gone on deployment and my wife is going to visit my wounded guys in the hospital or going to my guys funerals that's what she was doing so you know team effort for sure but she's the mvp and i'm just sort of you know the 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 bench the bench warmer over here the the now all that being said the the you know from the military look taking ownership of things which which i already talked about a little bit but there's nothing really that goes on in my family that i don't 
that that I would say no to my wife, no, that's your fault. Because I can just about guarantee that everything is my fault. When when there's something that's not right, when there's something going wrong, it, it's something that I it's a mistake that I made. I did something wrong. De escalation, right? Because my wife, while borderline saint, there you know, she's a human being. A lot of my friends would argue that she's just a saint, but she is a human being. And, you know, she might get mad about something. She might get frustrated with me about something. And being able to de- de-escalate those situations and not, not escalate them is very, very beneficial. And one of the best ways to do that is by taking ownership when something goes wrong. So I would say the de-escalation part, taking ownership is definitely beneficial. If you're blaming your, your wife, you're probably that's not going to work out great. And, and just the idea of, you know, trying to win, trying to win an argument. I mean, first of all, honestly, I don't really, I, I, I don't really argue with my wife. I probably have been in less than a handful, less than three or four arguments in my life with my wife. And and I can't even, I can't even really think of any right now. I'm just don't want to, you know, try and try and make myself out to, or make our relationship out to be something that's not, but we don't really argue very often. And so I, I can't even really say that, Hey, don't try and win an argument with your wife. Cause I'm not really having an argument with my wife. Um, I, I guess my, I guess my synopsis of this is pay attention to who you're going to get married to and <laughs> try and pick someone that is emotionally independent that has their own, has their own, that, that can handle life by themselves. And that, that can be, that can make some people feel insecure, right? Like I want someone that's relying on me all the time and I want them to feel like they need me. And that, that might be a trap for you if that's what you set yourself up with. So that's what I do. Find someone that's emotionally independent. Find someone that you get along well with. Find someone that's, that's, um, calm, you know, someone that's not, you know, that's not going to get, get bent out of shape about little things. And if they do a little de-escalation can kind of get the problem solved and then just, uh, have fun. You know, my wife and I have fun and I think that's important. It's very interesting to think about the fact that some people rely on a partner who is overly vulnerable, uh, or, um, overly anxiously attached as a way to bolster their own sense of reassurance in a relationship. I've, I've seen this quite a lot. Yeah, that's probably not going to be a great move. And look, you, a person, I don't, I don't know everyone. All I can do is talk for myself. And I would recommend you find someone that's more your equal, someone that you can engage with, someone, that's, someone that you're part of a team with rather than someone that you're sort of domineering over. I learned this the other day that there's only one sentence in the Bible about how you should choose a partner. And it says that you should choose someone that you could go to war with. Mm, I like it. That, that works. That's legit. It's a team effort, a relationship, right? And would you purposefully choose a particularly vulnerable teammate because you're always going to be the person that's out in front? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Now to push back a little bit about that. <laughs> Look, you, 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 there's guys I would be number one on my list to go to war with that probably are not going to be the best spouses in the you world. You wouldn't get in a relationship with them? <laughs> they're they're going to be they're going to be tough for, for a female to be married to because they're, they're wild, right? They're wild animals and they're the exact type of person that you would want to go to war with and that I've gone to war with. And a lot of times they're, they're not going to be great as, as husbands. Fair point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, people as well, I've been thinking recently, I spoke to Andrew Huberman last week and he was explaining to me about the similarities between the grief process and the breaking up process. Apparently neurologically, it's incredibly similar. So distance in time and space and something else, I think. And he was talking about how when you go through a breakup, it, it is the same uh, 
networks that are activated as through grief. And as somebody that has been to probably far more military funerals than we can remember or would have liked to, how does that inform your advice for people letting go of people that they lose in their life, whether that be through a breakup or, or, or through them passing? I talked about this on my podcast one time and speaking of Jocko videos that are out there and people have made videos of this. Yes, I have definitely lost too many of my friends and it took me a little while to start getting pattern recognition on what, what happens and it's a very clear pattern. And once I kind of put that out there, I've now heard from many, many scores of people that, yep, that's what it feels like. And I think if you know what it's going to feel like, just like anything else, if you know what to expect, then it's easier to contend with. So it's like a storm that is hitting you. You know, you lose someone, someone that you know dies, you are going to get put into a storm. And what's scary about it is it's, it's an emotional storm and you have no control over it. So you're going to break down, start crying. You're going to f- remember ho- bad things, good things. You're not going to be in control of your emotions, which is very difficult for adults because we're used to having some level of control over our emotions. So for a period of time, you're going to get hit with waves of emotion that you have no control over and they're going to knock you off your feet and you're not going to be able to finish a sentence. You're going to, it's, it, it's very, very difficult. But over time, th- that storm is going to fade a little bit. And those, those waves are going to get weaker. And, and those waves still may come. So I don't know if you've lost anyone that's close to you. No, which is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm an only child, two mm-hmm. parents, like dogs. Dogs yep. is it. So I have a particular um, interest. Right. In so there's going to be times where it's been a month since your friend died. And you're going to be sitting there and you're going to hear a song or you're going to smell a burger that you, you, you once had with this individual and you're going to get overcome with those waves of emotion again. And you might start crying right there. You might have this massive wave of emotion hit you and, it'll, and then it'll subside. And over time, the waves will become weaker and they'll become less frequent. And, and here's where people also get into trouble. They think that that means that they didn't care about that person. And that's not true at all. It's just that your mind is processing it and it's okay. So that's what happens. You start off with these huge, uncontrollable, emotional storm. That storm will pass. That's number one. Just know that that storm is normal and it's going to pass. And then it's going to still hit you. But over time, those waves of sadness and sorrow are going to get weaker and they're going to get less frequent and that's okay that's a good thing and look i haven't broken up with a with a girl in a long time but i you know when when people ask me about breaking up with girls is you know i've I, what you have to do when it's not working with a girl is wish them luck to give them the best of luck wish them luck walk away and don't look back. And you're still going to get those emotions. Those things are still going to hit you. But walk away and don't look back. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, if there's any chance that it's going to work out, the best possible way for you to get it to work out is by walking away, by wishing them luck, walking away and don't look back. That's the best way. How so? Because if there is something there, then she will let you know eventually. And if there's nothing there, you're going to know that too because you never hear, hear from her again. That's fine. The protocol for getting her back is to walk away and don't look back. That's the protocol is to move on. The protocol, if she doesn't want you back, is to walk away and don't look back. So I, look, and I know it's hard, but you'll, you'll get some of those waves, but those waves will become less frequent and they'll become less powerful and eventually you can move on. And then, you know, the last thing I'll say about this is in both these scenarios is Remember, but don't dwell. So, so you got it. You look, you remember your friends, you honor your friends, you remember what they gave you, what they taught you, what you learned from them, what was great about them, what you miss about them. You remember all those things, but you don't dwell in the past and, and dwell on those thoughts and dwell on the loss all the time because that's not healthy either. And it's not, not going to help you. And it's not what your friend would want you to do anyways. 
I like the insight around when you are going through grief and then you stop the sense of guilt that comes through because you feel now somehow that you're doing a disservice to their memory, like you didn't really care or something like yep. that. Yeah. It helps to, you know, it helps to write about, I, what, what I've told people to do is write that person a letter and tell them what you loved about them, what you're gonna miss about them, how you felt about them, what you regret. You write all that stuff in a letter, put it in an envelope, bring it to their grave and put it there. And, and that will help you process as well. I mean, I've, unfortunately or fortunately, I've, I've given a bunch of eulogies for friends that I've lost. And in the beginning, I didn't really recognize that that's a way of healing, but certainly writing down your emotions, your feelings, what you're going to miss, what you loved about them is very therapeutic and it's very good. And so that's another thing I recommend is you write that stuff down and, and you, you bring it to them. That's another Petersonism from his Rules for Life. He says, if memories still make you cry, write them down. Yep. That's a, you know, I talk a lot about being able to detach from your emotions and it's very important. Well, when you write something down, you are literally detaching from those thoughts because they're going out on a piece of paper that you, then you can see. So it's a very important thing to do to write down if there's emotions that you have to deal with, write down. And I just like to give someone some kind of an objective. So instead of just saying, write down the emotions, no, here's, the, write that person, tell them, and that will kind of be like a, a writing prompt to get you to write the right things about that situation. I'm pretty interested in your impact on kids. So I had a comment uh, from a father saying how much he couldn't wait for this episode because his son's read all of your books and we're timing my nine-year-old's mile run times every week because of Jocko. So if, if, if nothing else, there is a nine-year-old out there with his dad stood with a stopwatch as he sprints around a park on a Saturday morning or something at the moment. What, what business does a SEAL have writing kids' books? Well, I'm, I don't know necessarily if any SEAL has any business doing anything. I know that I have four kids and that I wanted to... When, when I was raising my kids, there, was, there wasn't really any books that carried the message of the values that I wanted my kids to have. And so I just wrote my own. And there you go pretty straightforward is that similar to you uh do you think entering into the is it a reflection there from the seals the fact that there wasn't a, a guidebook or a handbook uh for operations mm -hmm. when you first came in and, and you've almost had this twice you've had this in uh, both your career and in fatherhood yeah. as well yeah like there is there is some weaknesses to not having doctrine and there's also some strength when you do have doctrine and you know you know that boiled down to I was very lucky that I joined the military because when I joined the military, it, it was, I, I had a, a structure, a pathway to execute on. And that's very, very beneficial <laughs> for a young idiot kid that's filled with energy and rebellion and aggression. That's, that's awesome. Here, take all that energy and aggression and rebellion and, and focus it in this direction. It's going to be beneficial. And you'll actually get rewarded for it. You'll get promoted for it. That's, amazing and kids didn't really have any kind of a code where hey these are some general rules that will that you will benefit from in life and so there you go that's the warrior kid what about kids or the parents of kids that are being bullied in school this to me seems like a very unique challenge for uh, generally for people to come up against because a lot of the time you're able to have an impact on a situation. You're able to do something that moves it forward. But, you know, you can go and have a conversation with the head teacher or, or whatever, but that, that doesn't necessarily fix culturally sort of what's going on within the school. There's only so much that teachers can do in terms of oversight. You, know, you, you can't go into the school and punch the other kid in the face. So that's also not a solution as much as you might want to do that. Well, it's not going to help your kid any either right? You, you have to train your kid to be able to contend with the world, not tell your kid that you're always going to be there to back them up and beat up anyone that gets in their way. Like that's not going to help your kid become a better human. So no, what you want to do is teach your kid 
what you want to do is to actually teach your kid how to fight. You want your kid to train jujitsu. You want your kid to train boxing. You want your kid to be an actual force to be reckoned with. And and what's crazy about this is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, if there's a bigger, a much bigger person than you, they can still beat you up, you know, and that's the thing with kids. You know, if you're 10 years old, you can be a really well-trained 10-year-old, but a 14-year-old is probably going to get the better of you and, and maybe 15-year-old, but there's still going to be situations that it's going to be, you, you're going to lose a fight. Uh, that being said, the risk for the bully goes exponentially higher when he knows that he's got someone on his hands that can actually, actually knows how to fight. And so the probability of bullying taking place goes way down, way down. And even if that bully wins the fight, he's not going to look good. It's going to be a problem. He, he's going he's gonna to get a, 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 vict- a worthless victory because he's going to beat up. He's going to barely get the better of someone that's a lot smaller than, than the bully himself. So, and all this stuff, all this stuff, I guess we could talk to Andrew Huberman, but this is stuff you recognize. There's a, there's a primal recognition of someone that knows how to fight and someone that doesn't. And this is, this is, kids can recognize this. They recognize, oh, I'm getting in this kid's face and he doesn't seem to be bothered by this. And he's got a little bit of a smile on his face. I might not want to push this any further. And and that's a real thing. So jujitsu, boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai will elevate that primordial confidence in a young man or a young, a young boy or young girl that is going to prevent so much bullying from happening that it's incredible. So look, can you still get beat up? Yes, you absolutely can. Are you probably going to do okay? Yes, you most likely are. Is your now what's, what's lame is, you know, if you go back pre UFC, there would be martial arts instruction that would, hey, we're going to help your kid with their confidence. And they would, kids would get more confident, but it wasn't based on reality. You know, going back to the Detroit, you know, your friend at the Detroit defense <laughs> tactics him, or whatever. Don't you call him my friend. Going back to that guy, he's teaching things that might help someone's confidence, but they're not going to help in real life. Yes. So Which is, is that potentially even more dangerous? Oh, it's, it's, it's infinitely more da- yeah. dangerous yeah. because a kid that knows jujitsu, a 10 year old kid that knows jujitsu and, and there's a 14 year old kid, that kid knows, Hey, even though I know jujitsu, it's going to be a problem. This kid's a lot bigger than me. He's probably stronger than me. And this is going to be a problem. I need to figure out a way to deescalate this as opposed to getting told, Hey, all you have to do is this strike and that, that strike, and then you'll win a fight. No, that's actually not true. So yes, that is more harmful to have somebody with fake confidence. That that's a real problem. But in training and in becoming stronger, in being able to do pull-ups, in being able to run, you know, for the young kid that's running, that kid's got some good cardio if he's timing his mile runs, right? All those things are gonna help make a more capable human who is a lot less likely. By the way, he's more confident. Guess what else he has when he's more confident? He's got more friends. His friends are now looking at this bully going, hey, man, you don't want to mess with our friend. And now we have a situation where it's probably going to get de-escalated just because of of schoolyard politics and primal politics that that play out between any group of human beings. I'll never forget when I was in secondary school, one of my friends, Carl, his granddad was a judo teacher and had been for a very, very long time. And Carl had done it since he could walk. As soon as he walked, he he was doing judo. And he's now 14, or 15. Mm-hmm. And there's a, one of those kids in school that must have hit puberty at nine mm-hmm. or something. And this guy's huge. And he was one of the, the big bullies in school. And I'll never forget that he squared up to him and Carl was grinning in his face, yep. smiling in his face, just couldn't wait for something to happen. And I think that that kind of highlights one of the main differences. Like getting in a fight is probably not that bad as a kid. In fact, it could be a, a useful formative experience to make you, um, to educate you in the future about what it feels like to be in a physical altercation with people. The thing that's concerning it is the fear around the fight, right? It's the anxiety and, and the worries about the bullying. So in a way, 
yes, the skills, you need to have the skills that actually back up. You don't want to have a reality which is detached from what you predict is going to happen. But one of the most important things is to just feel comfortable in a situation that is going to become dynamic. 100%. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell this when I start talking to women about self-defense. If you have never had someone grab hold of you, the mental hurdle you have to get over just to be able to respond in an adequate way is immense. That mental hurdle is immense. If you do jujitsu, someone's grabbing a hold of you 27 times a day on the mat. <laughs> they're grabbing your neck, they're grabbing your arm. You're totally used to this, to this close proximity combat that you're entering into. So yes, a huge benefit of training to fight is that you don't have any mental hurdle to get over. Your friend that trained judo his whole life, he was just ready to rock and roll at that point. There's no fear whatsoever. This is what he does every single day. That's, again, a, a great reason to get out there and train. It's kind of like a superpower. Uh, yes, it's 100%. Jiu-jitsu is 100% a superpower. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's 100%. You know, that's one of my kids asked me when it was my son. He asked me when he was a little kid, the movie, the Incredibles came out and he said, Hey dad, is there really such a thing as superpower? And I said, Hmm, yes, there is. It's a little thing that you do every day. It's called jujitsu. And, and eventually he realized that, Oh, I, I can actually fight anybody and it's going to be fine. And that's a very beneficial thing to have because there's always, uh, I guess I'm a, a little bit biased because of the way, kind of the, 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 how I grew up. There's always violence. There's always some sort of inferred level of violence. I mean, a SEAL platoon, there's a pecking order, you know, and it has to do with, with fighting. <laughs> and, and that's the same with any group of, of, of knuckle dragger, Neanderthal men that are in a group. There's always a guy that's, that, yeah, that guy's kind of, he's the one that can kind of beat everyone up. It's the way it is. So I'm sorry that it's that way. I'm sorry it's not a cerebral contest, but man. Well, there's only two forms of communication. One of them is words and the other one is violence. And when the first one fails, that's when the second one comes about. And I, I absolutely think, I, dude, I've stood on the front door of a thousand club nights, right? I've met about a million people stood mm -hmm. on the front door of nightclubs. I have seen a, literally hundreds of fights occur when people have had a bit to drink. And I spoke to a, uh, an anthropologist um, and he was drawing parallels between the ways that uh, particularly guys um, when they first start to fight especially if they've, their inhibitions are lowered a little bit uh, and he was drawing a parallels between that and the way that other animals fight as well so he said one of the first things that you'll see men do is that they'll start to circle each other he said what do deer do you know when they've got the they've mm -hmm. got their antlers and they'll circle and what they're doing they kind of they're, they're sizing each other up and they'll circle and they'll circle and they'll circle and then they'll come in and they'll push first maybe and what's that doing oh it's getting kind of a feel mm -hmm. for what's going on it's getting a sense of just how big is it do i really really want to go do i want to go do i right i'll give it a and then maybe you come back and do it again and then circle a little bit more and circle a little bit more i thought it was so fascinating yeah. Do I really want to go? Do they really want to go yeah. too? Like maybe I can just get away with a push and they'll yep. realize that. Yep. Yeah, uh, th there's some definite comparisons there. There's, I'm sorry to inform everybody, but we're animals and that stuff. Shines some of us through. more than others. <laughs> yeah, some of us more than others. <laughs> I just thought there were you talking about women doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Is there some? Is there a particularly unique challenge? I mean, women are very hardwired to avoid being grabbed and, and, and uh, laid on by a man that's much larger than them, even if it is in a controlled situation, right? Even if it is in, in a class or whatever. Are there some particularly unique challenges that, that girls have when they begin to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu or have you, have you found that there are uh, hurdles that girls have to get over just generally? Is there something like innate in their programming that kind of causes them to, to react in a, in a different way? Yeah. Um, I would say it's not normal for a girl or a woman to want some dude all up on them. And that's what jujitsu is. You are all up on each other. And, you know, it's, it, it's a very, for lack of a better word, it's very intimate con contact that you're having with another human being. So there's, 
it, it is a hurdle. It's absolutely a hurdle for, for women and girls to get over. And once I get over it, it's like, okay, cool. And then it's much better to get over it on the mats in a jiu-jitsu academy than it is to have to contend with that psychological hurdle when you're in a problematic scenario and you're being attacked. That is not the time to try and figure out what matters and what doesn't matter and what this feels like and what that feels like. And yeah, you want to train and you want to overcome that hurdle in a nice, safe environment. Thinking about the bullying topic, I was considering about what that causes in later life. So I had a, a bit of a tough sort of school upbringing with bullying and stuff like that. And I was thinking about it, reflecting on it a lot, and I realized that a lot of the things that that created downstream in later life are the things that I most value in myself. And this has been a very difficult thing for me to, to kind of pass, to just work out like, hang on, if I, do I need to thank the bullies in a way? Have they created some of the things in myself that I most value? So for instance, um, moved out to America to come and do the podcast. That has only been afforded to me really because I, I don't care about being solitary. I don't care about being on my own. I don't care about taking risks because for a very long time I was in any case on my own and everything was a risk. Going to school was a risk or going out for lunch was a risk or whatever. And then thinking about how, thinking about how I, uh, notice certain things. Right. Uh, I went to a party not long ago and was obsessed about the fact for about the first five minutes, obsessed about uh, half of the people had taken their shoes and socks off, but half of the people had only taken their shoes off and left their socks on. But the reason that I was paying so much attention is because in school, I would obsess over um, the way that certain kids had their hair cut or the way that they would carry their bag or the way that they would do their tie, because I was sure that that was the reason that they had friends and I didn't. I was trying to deconstruct in other people socially what was going on with them that meant that they and I, obviously i didn't realize it's that they were sociable probably and were communicating well and whatever you know a, a classic only child with like sprinkling of autism or whatever so like <laughs> um but i really value that i value the fact that i i, I pay that much attention and it got me thinking more and more about a lot of the things that we really value in ourselves as adults are the light side of something that we probably are a little bit embarrassed about. And I was wondering whether, first off, whether you see that dynamic in yourself, whether there are, there are things that you most value that, that have um, costs that you need to pay, and then also whether uh, perfect childhoods create weak adults. So go, going back to the conversation I had with Sam Harris, um, he kind of called me out on the fact that I had said something along the lines is, of combat was sort of when I most felt alive and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I also would say the worst days of my life were in war, losing my friends and war is horrible. And the way I responded to it, and I asked him if he had anyone had, had ever known anyone that had cancer and had come out the other side. And he said, yes. And I said, oftentimes those people say, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I'm glad it happened to me because it gave me such a better perspective about life and about value and about the fragility of life and all those things. And that's the way I feel about combat. I don't wish it on anybody, but I wouldn't, wouldn't give it up. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And so I think what you're talking about is a great way of looking at your past to say, oh, okay, um, I had some hardships and I benefited from those. It's basically the same thing as saying, got bullied, good. Now I know how to handle myself a little bit better. I didn't have a bunch of friends, good. Now I feel more comfortable when I'm alone. I think it's the same sort of attitude in, in both those situations. And then as far as, as far as, how people are raised and what you get. It's, it's an interesting thing and the, the, probably the only thing I can talk with any th level of understanding of, and it's actually a lack of understanding, is basic SEAL training. Because basic SEAL training 
you would think, well, you know, this person comes from a hard background, they didn't have much growing up, they're hungry, and now they have this opportunity and they're never gonna quit. Or you say, oh, you know, this person went to a nice private school and they grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth and when they get to this harsh environment, they're probably gonna quit. And the fact is that's not true in either one of those cases. Some kids that grew up in very tough environments, you know, working 18 hours a day on a dairy farm, they show up to Buds and quit. And, and some kids that grew up, you know, working 18 hours a day on a dairy farm, they'll never quit. And some kids that grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth, they show up and quit. And some kids that show up with a silver spoon in their mouth, they never quit. So I think there's some inherent characteristic of a person that it, your environment plays a role, but it can be overcome by determination. And I think you probably have a lot more control over what you do in your life than your background does. That is the, uh, I think, the genesis of uh, why I love agency so much, why I love the ability to live your life by design, not by default. The fact that you get to forge whatever the path is that you want to go forward. Like that to me is, especially as someone that, like I say, maybe grew up feeling, feeling a little bit helpless. Uh, the fact that you realize, hang on, if I if I put this amount of work in, and I dedicate myself and I'm committed and so on and so forth, the fact that you can come out the other side of that and realize that it has real world returns to you is, it, it's phenomenal. It's, it, it, it's one of the most rewarding, most empowering, I hate that word, but <laughs> it, you know what I mean? Like it's kind of, it's, one of, it's just been ruined. Like empower, empowerment has been ruined as a word, but it's actually really useful and I can't use anything else. But it's, it's, it's good. It's a, it's a great feeling. Yeah. That kind of recognition is what allows people to move on in life and take control of their life and make things happen. And, and, you know, going back to your earlier thing about, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone, it's not working saying, you know what, this isn't working and I'm going to move on. That's a good thing. You have to take ownership and that doesn't mean ownership, meaning I'm always at fault and therefore I'm going to sit here and do nothing. It's like, oh, I'm at fault for even being in this relationship with this person. I'm going to move on. No factor. I've heard you say that you wouldn't be doing anything that you're doing now if it wasn't for surfing. How so? Well, surfing, oh, I started surfing when I was 10 years old. I was very lucky that a guy decided to teach me how to surf. A, a, a lifeguard said, hey, I'm going to teach you how to surf. And he did. And yeah, that's a huge... that completely directed my life because when you're looking at all the special operations unit to, units to go into, you know, there's Rangers, there's special forces, there's Marine Corps, special operations, there's all these different things that you can go and do. And one of them is primarily focused on the water. And one of them, you can get stationed either in San Diego, California or Virginia Beach, Virginia. And it was just such a no brainer for me. So are you saying that part of your military career was dictated by where the good surf was? A hundred percent. Yep. hundred <laughs> percent. And making it through training, if I wouldn't have surfed, I may not have made it through training because your comfort level in the water is so high from surfing. And, you know, I grew up surfing in New England and it's freezing cold. And so the cold water to me was a joke and the water problems were relatively easy for me compared to someone that didn't spend a bunch of time in the water. So surfing is a, is a great thing to have in your background if you're going to go try and be a seal or you know if you played water polo if you're on the swim team something that makes you super comfortable in the water is going to be highly beneficial and that's probably the biggest separator in people that make it and in fact it is people that make it and don't make it if you're comfortable in the water you have a much better chance of making it if you're let me rephrase that if you're not comfortable in the water your chance of making it through seal training is very small so people that were uh swimmers in high school or whatever yeah, massive yeah. massive advantage massive advantage surfing massive advantage water polo massive advantage yep i heard someone say the other day that if they could if they could give their kid three sports to do throughout their uh their childhood one would be a martial art that's effective one would be gymnastics to learn their body in space and one would be some sort of swimming uh, water-based event to learn their body in water i thought those That's are those are solid picks right there. Seems seems like you're going to create a bit of a beast of a kid there. Yeah, yeah. It's um, 
the whole water thing, I mean, you see this, right? look at any event, look at CrossFit games or something, right? And there's always one guy, because there's usually a swim, run, bike, or a paddleboard, run, something else event in there. There's always one guy that swam in college. And you go, okay, so <laughs> these people train six hours a day, five or six days a week for forever. And they're the elite of the elite when it comes to fitness. And homeboy is, is half the time mm-hmm. of the rest of the field. It, it can't be just due to fitness. It's got to be due to something else. There's people with more capacity. He'll come 15th yeah. in a field of 40 of the overall. But on that event, you really do see the, the experience that, that someone that knows how to swim has. It's Tec- like worlds apart. Technique. It's, it's technique. I <laughs> mean, just like anything else, just like jujitsu, technique will win. Rock climbing, technique will win. It's interesting that people think you'd be able to fight without training, but you. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you be able to play guitar without training? It's the same exact thing. Well, no, but when I get really angry, yeah. my guitar. Yeah, your guitar playing, comes out. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what people think. Same thing with leadership. People think, oh, well, you can't really learn leadership. It's like, no, leadership is a skill, just like guitar is a skill. There's moves that are just like playing chords, and people don't understand that. And, and that's, you know, one of the reasons I am able to, to have, that's why I have a company teaching leadership because it's like, oh, you mean you're not just born with this? You mean you're not just born knowing how to swim? You're not just born knowing how to play guitar, and you're not just born knowing how to lead? You have to learn how to do it. And you can learn how to do it. Oh, you can absolutely learn how As to do it. As opposed to a fixed mindset of this is me, this is where I'm at. I don't know guitar now, therefore I'm never going to know guitar. Right. I'm not a leader now. I don't have creativity. You know, first thing that we we spoke about. Can you explain to me? I've always wanted someone that knows uh, surfing to explain this to me. Let's say that you're surfing a big swell mm-hmm. and you go under. Can you explain h- how you get out from underneath a large wave when you're below the water? I've he- I've heard about so you swim out sideways and there's like a particular. Well, so in what you're talking about sideways, I'm assuming what you're talking about is certain breaks have a channel, meaning the waves break in one area, but there's deeper water on either side of the break, and therefore the waves don't break there. And you can see this in any any of the big famous surf spots, or many, most of the big famous surf spots, you can look and you can see there's a boat sitting here taking pictures of people that are surfing the waves. That boat is sitting in deep water. And the wave is breaking in shallow water. So generally, if you get if you fall or you're trying to paddle back out, you go into the deep water and you paddle out, and there's no waves breaking there. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was something to do with the fact that if you were down, uh, if you were uh, taken under the water, mm-hmm. relatively deep below where the waves were, um, that trying to swim either toward land or back is a bad idea. I'm going to guess that. Oh, so what you're talking about is a, is a is a rip current. So a rip current is an area of the beach where the the waves are coming in and a rip current takes all the water that's coming in towards the towards the beach and it all kind of funnels in one area and goes back out to sea it's called a rip current okay and if you try and swim directly into the beach you won't be able to get there because that rip current can be going three knots or four knots it can be strong and you can't swim that fast and so you'll sit there and swim till exhaustion and you'll die so what you do is you swim parallel to the beach and then you'll drift out a little further as you swim parallel, but eventually you'll swim out of the rip current, then you can swim into the beach. That's what I meant. Yep, there you go. There's two ways that life seems to be short to me. So one is in the fact that days go by pretty quickly and we seem to get old uh, a lot sooner perhaps than we expect. And the other is that tomorrow is not necessarily promised to us and that things can end pretty quickly. How do you think people can remind themselves of this shortness of life? We're very distracted at the moment. There is always something that can take us away from the present moment. And there are things that we're moving toward that are in the future. How can people remind themselves of the urgency that life has to it? I mean, you know, for me, it's real easy because I, I know that a lot, of, a lot of my friends that are not here, and th- that's all I need to, that's all I need to know. And I mean, I think about that every day. So there's no, for, I, for me personally, there's no, there's no lack of urgency when I wake up in the morning to think, oh, don't worry, I got all the time in the world because I know I don't. And 
I'm lucky to be here and I'm going to try and live in a way that will at least do justice for my friends that aren't here. Tim Kennedy said that he looked back at a photo of maybe the graduating class that he was in or certainly some uh, uh, unit that he was a part of and he looked at it and he realized that he was the only person that was left from that photo, the only one. And, you know, it's one of those things. It's kind of like the, the um, I got cancer and I, I, I sort of didn't want it, but I'm glad that it happened to me because on the other side of it, it's kind of feels a little bit like the same energy as that, that you go, well, do I want to lose all of my friends? No, absolutely not. Have I been able to, like alchemy, have I been able to take something from that? Like the bullying thing in later life, right? Have I been able to, turn that, transmute that into something mm -hmm. that I really value. Uh, and I suppose that that's one of the ways as well. It, it is about as good of a, forget eulogies, forget the service, forget the nice words. It's okay, because of what this person did for me while they were alive, now that they've passed, look at how much more I'm living. Look at, I mean, is there any better tribute to somebody? Definitely makes you appreciate the sunsets more. We were watching it last night. It's very, very nice over here. Another thing I've been thinking about with the shortness of life is the, so I'm 34, and it's only been within the last maybe two years or so, two to three years, where age has started to actually feel like a thing. Now, obviously, it was a, it was a, a new age was a thing. And, but for most of your 20s, what you're doing is you're becoming stronger, faster, smarter, a everything continues to get better. And then there's a, a point, kind of like at the top of a roller coaster, where the inertia comes in and you feel everything be a bit weightless. And you start to realize, well, recovery from workouts is taking just a little bit longer than it used to. And injuries are taking a little bit more to get past. And I mean, the hangover thing has been happening since I was like 24. Like that <laughs> just linearly got worse since I was 24. Um, but there is a point at which you become kind of aware of your own mortality, uh, not in a my friends have died way, but in a entropy way. Do you have any advice to men that are getting older and becoming chronically aware of that? Yeah, lift weights, do jujitsu, go for runs, stretch out, eat good, stop drinking. It's pretty straightforward. If you don't, uh, if you don't use it, you're you're gonna lose it. Every day that you don't do work, you're going backwards. And it, and it definitely w will hurt you, and it'll show up. You can't get away with what you got away with when you were 23. You, you, it doesn't work. You, you, have to, you have to stay ahead of it. I had uh, Nate Zinsa, Dr. Nate Zinsa. Uh, he's a, it's one of the special forces. He was their, uh, their mindset coach, the psychology coach. And uh, he was telling me, I was asking him, what, um, what age is it that you can finish applying for the SEAL? Is it 28, 25? It's, it's 28. I think it's 28 or 29. And I asked, what, what, what's the reason for there being an upper bound? I mean, there's guys in their 30s that are super fit. You, you guys in the UFC in their 40s that are super fit. And he said, well, it's about what the body can tolerate, especially during selection. He was telling me the story about um, one of the uh, climbing uh, rope climbing uh, sections, 30 feet high over sand, and some 20, 21 year old kid fell from the top, flat on his stomach, and apparently just bounced off the floor and got up and started running. He thought, actually, yeah, if, if he was 38, that's a, that's a very different reaction after you've dropped foot 30 feet onto sand. Yeah, the training is gonna, it's gonna destroy, des it destroys kids. And so if you're not ready to recover very quickly, it's going to be a problem. And I think, you know, are there people that could pull it off? Sure, there are. And there are. They, there are guys that get waivers that are 32 years old and they're super studs and they make it. But if you did, if you ran the numbers, which I'm sure the Navy ran the numbers and is like, oh, the, I mean, quite frankly, I just learned this figure the other day. People that are younger than 20 have like a 5% chance of making it through. Of making through basic SEAL training. Okay. Because they just don't have the, the maturity and they might not be strong enough yet. And I mean, I would say the optimum age is probably like 23, 24. You're stronger. 
but I mean, I was, I, I went through when I was young, I was 19 years old and you know, and you were it. pretty light, slight compared with now, right? When you I went st- through, I started it, I was 174 when I went through. What are you, six, one, six, two? Five, eleven. Hey, okay. Yep. And oh, yeah. 185 when I graduated. So I gained like 11 pounds going through SEAL training. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. And, and which is, you know, when you're young, I mean, my body is just, you know, seeping testosterone yeah. you know 19 years old you're working out all day long feeling it with chicken yeah. nuggets and yeah chicken nuggets getting after it just all the food you can possibly eat it's it's awesome <laughs> but it's an abusive training program it's hard on the body it, it trashes guys for sure i mean hearing uh goggin's stories about his three times through i mean he got he was not due to quitting right i mean his mentality was prepared to take him further than his body was twice um, I mean, that must be brutal to think about the fact. I often think about this to do with athletes that get injured, how unfair it is that you get injured because it's you are ready to do the thing and you may have done everything perfectly. And there's something something outside of your control in your physiology that said, no, nope. nope. you don't get to do this. Yeah, the SEAL training is not fair at all. Yeah. It's not fair at all. And there's, I'm sure there's, good guys that don't make it because they just physically can't handle it. Th- that being said, the, pro- the way the program works, it, 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 for the most part, if you don't make it, it's because you didn't make it. Like they have There's guys- way that, more people that ring the bell than have blown out knees or whatever. It's, it's, 80, it's probably 85, 90% that ring out. 10% that get some injury that is incurable. Uh, because they'll let you heal up. They let guys stay there for a while to heal up. Um, but yeah, it's an abusive program. Say that with a smile on your face. <laughs> Are there any other um, special forces selections that you're aware of that are uh, comparable in terms of the difficulty? They're all, they're all hard. They all have their own tests and they are all screening out a bunch of people. And I've only been through one and they're all, they're all different ways of beating you up. I mean, mean, you know, for instance, ranger school, you don't eat a lot. So people lose 20 pounds during ranger school. Um, That's preparing them for being wilderness isolation in the field. Yep. Um, Special Forces has its own things to push you. So everyone's got their own little techniques of getting rid of guys. SAS is a lot of orienteering. It's a lot of yep. Brecken beacons. It's up and down hills, heavy Bergen packs. Yep. On your own, no. You don't know how much time you've got. They just say, do your best. You, oh, you Try didn't, not to let us catch yep, you. You didn't make the time. You're out. Which I is, mean, you didn't know what the time was. but You didn't know what the time was, but it wasn't fast enough. In SEAL training, you, you're not allowed to wear a watch. So how, how fast do you have to run as fast as you can? At least for me, I had to run as in fast as I can. In SEAL training, you're not allowed to wear a watch. Not allowed to wear a watch. You don't know how long anything is going to take. You don't know how long you've been <laughs> swimming for. Your only choice is to go hard. <laughs> that's, that's good, right? We just want you to go as hard as you can. I did a reality TV show about seven years ago. And um, on that, they removed all of our watches before we went in. And all of the clocks of the guys that came in to change the batteries on our microphones they changed them all so they didn't tell the right time. The uh, watches of the drivers, the cars that we got in, and we never found out why that was the case. I thought, I think it was because uh, they didn't want us to know when we were going to bed and waking up because everyone was excitable and 18 or whatever. How long were you in the field for? <laughs> I was in the show for about a month. Uh, but I mean, I'm, what were the, what, what kind of tasks were the time tasks that you were, that you were executing? So, uh, unfortunately this isn't as uh, reputable as doing a reality TV show about, um, armed forces. This is a dating show and dating, like dating, like a, a bachelor. Oh, like Paradise male, female yes. scenario. Yes. Check. Uh, I'm not equating the two between doing buds and going on <laughs> love Island. Um, but my point is that um, I think what they were trying to do was just uh, put, take the power from the people that were um, the subjects to the people that were in control. 
and disorient the the people that were there. Like they, they were actually, it wasn't like a a challenge thing where people were uh, having limited food or doing challenges to stay in and stuff like that. It was exclusively about romance. But what they'd found was that there was something, there must have been something that they thought that was effective by doing that. And um, thankfully I just didn't have to, I didn't have to swim as much as, as you guys did. So <laughs> I, I came out the other side of that feeling all right. I'm glad you made it. I, I did. Well, I mean, like I'm here today. It was, it was difficult. Um, I spoke to Michael Punky Higgs. You know him? SEAL, yep. Commander Chief, Master Chief. Yep. I spoke to him and he's doing some stuff with psychedelics at the moment, um, which I, I found absolutely fascinating. And he very carefully walked me through the um, reason that he, he felt he needed. I mean, he'd had a gun to his head, I think two or three times separately. Uh, he was really, really struggling. And um, he's doing, I think it's in Mexico is his, his place mm -hmm. where he's doing psychedelic therapy for veterans. What's your what's your thoughts on on that? Uh, Punky's awesome, awesome guy. Um, I'm glad you said Michael Punky Higgs because otherwise I just said my guy. It would have taken me a minute, but yeah, Punky's an awesome guy. Uh, I I've never tried that stuff, and I, I've I've definitely talked to a lot of guys that it's helped out. And if something's going to help guys out, I, I think it's good to go for people to go try it. But I haven't tried it myself, and I don't I don't know. I don't know too much about it. Um, I've had some friends that have done it. Uh, my friend Dakota Meyer, I had him on the podcast and he talked about his experiences. I've talked to Tim Ferriss a decent amount about it because- He's huge into it at the moment, right? He He's is. Investing and, and- Yeah, and, and before I had Dakota on and I knew Dakota and I were gonna talk about it, I actually called Tim and like took notes so that I had a better understanding because I don't know, I don't know I don't know enough about it to be able to comment on it. For me, it's just being on the outside trying to trying to explain or at least share, I guess, share the story of people that have utilized them and it's been helpful for. So I don't know a lot about it. Was it, um, was it Dakota that was talking, might have been on Rogan about, it's a, a type of patch, some sort of patch or a single time thing that they maybe do on it, the neck? Yeah, that's, a, that's another thing. That's a, that's a, uh, Stella ganglion block, I that's believe it. it's called. That's it. yep. And that's another thing that people that use. That sounds absolutely wild. It, it's a single time thing. You do have to get it, you know, periodically, you know, every right. six months, every year. I forget what the, the date is, but yes, that's another thing that's been very effective for some people. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not in any position to talk about this stuff with any, uh, with, with any knowledge whatsoever, other than Hey, I've I've had some friends that have done it, and they've said it's been useful. It's been helpful. Seals were very publicity shy for a long time, and that trend of the the quiet professional was uh, pretty strong. Do you ever regret being so recognizable or, or, or well known? I mean, I spent my whole life just kind of being very, you know, unrecognizable. And, and there's some, there's some very nice things about that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, when I, now that I'm, now that I'm more recognizable, you know, some of those advantages of being unrecognizable are gone. But for me, the being able to help people out has been worth the the pain <laughs> and i use that term very loosely worth the worth the the small inconveniences of you know being re recognized by by people and most of the people that recognize me are cool people that say hey man listen to your podcast thanks and i say hey man no problem you know appreciate it, it so it's not, it, you know i'm not in some weird scenario i don't have you know most people that listen to the podcast are pretty cool people and that you'd probably want to meet. Yeah, that I, that I would want to meet and hang out with. And they usually have something positive to say or some insight that they can give me, something that I missed, something that they could clarify for me. So it's all good. It's no factor, really. I walked down Broadway in Nashville with Jordan Peterson on a Friday night last year. And that was, uh, that was a sight to behold. Mm -hmm. That was like, I mean, he managed to accumulate a queue of people 
um, to see as he walked down the street he was who's what's that is that Jordan Peterson oh and then he ended up buying a Stetson hat and doing like the Michael Jackson mm-hmm. thing like the walk <laughs> yeah uh, in an attempt to like get through the crowd um, but yeah I just thought I thought it was interesting because you you'd spent all of this time and, and and again you had this culture in the seals of the the quiet professional and stuff and I was interested in the price that you know it's kind of like being in service again in a weird way, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, compared with going to war, people coming up to you in the street or wanting to take a selfie and stuff, like, you know, yeah. not even in the same universe. But my point being that there is still, there's things that you have to put up with or do in order to get the message out there and your sense is that it's worth it. Yeah, it's 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 fine. I mean... Again, the amount of feedback that I get from people that are that have benefited greatly is well worth you know any small inconveniences that I might have in my life. It's no factor. What do you think it was about um, your task unit that ended up caused it to contain so many particularly elite operators? I mean, it seems to me like there's been a lot. I mean, you know, yourself, life. Uh, Chris Kyle, uh, was Latrell in there as well? Uh, no, he was no. not. But it, my point being, like, it's that's like a fairly illustrious list. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't I'm struggling to see to remember what word you just used to describe the level of operators. But I mean, we were kind of normal, kind of a normal task unit. N- nothing spectacular. We had a we had, we got put into a combat environment that was a target rich environment and went hard in 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 that deployment and you know that's that's kind of how it turned out you know a seal team a seal platoon you're gonna get it's it's a bell curve like any other group and there's some awesome guys in every seal platoon there's a bunch of really good guys in the seal platoon and there's a couple you know (laughs) not so awesome guys in the seal platoon but they're gonna they're gonna do their job too sometimes and you know there's that's the way it is and you know we we that deployment had a lot of visibility uh on it because it was because there was a very kinetic deployment and um you know we also you know just from a from a historical standpoint you know mark lee was in was it was with us and he was the first seal killed in iraq and mikey monsoor was with us and mikey you know was was awarded the medal of honor posthumously and and so those kind of things sort of definitely drew drew the spotlight to what had happened and and that deployment what was chris kyle like in real life just a awesome funny guy that was a good patient sniper and cared about his job and cared about his family and was a you know was was a good a damn good sniper that would stay on his gun for a very long time and you know he was also very funny very gregarious always doing pranks just uh, just a good a, a good guy like like we were talking about earlier, the kind of guy you want to go to war with how did it feel watching that movie you know it's 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 a hollywood movie and i i i kind of went into it with rudimentary understanding that this movie's not going to be some documentary depiction of everything that happened yeah they have to take a guy and take his whole life and take multiple deployments and condense that all down in a very short time period they got to take a a very complex combat situation and bear and and distill that down into like good guy bad guy and 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 that's what they did and and i you know um also trying to show the the sacrifices that the families make and how hard it is on the families that's was probably the most important part of the story and so it was you know i watched it and and kind of i as i watched it i kind of understood those things and you know like that was that to me, the conversation around 
the family of servicemen and service women families um is is definitely one that 15 years ago i don't remember thinking about as much and now is one of the things that's at the front of my mind that when you have somebody that goes on operation and serves it's not just them that pay the price and it's not just them and the support units that are out there and the drivers and the people on the ground and the fixers and the translators and stuff there's a literal army of people back home as well that have to pay sometimes just as high of a price yeah um, in some cases higher um you know when you when i'm on deployment i know what's happening i know what is going on i know what the risks are i know what i can do to mitigate those risks my my wife my kids were too young to understand but my wife she knows what the risks are she and well let me rephrase that she doesn't know what the risks are she doesn't know how we're mitigating risks she doesn't know what it's like on the ground so it's very easy for someone in the family to start you know believing the worst things that are happening and every you know when you see that there's a casualty in Al, there's two marines killed in al anbar province or there's four marines killed in al anbar province and you know that the vast majority of those casualties are taking place in the city of ramadi which is where your husband is that can create some that can create some that can create some drama in your head and that can make that deployment worse for the family at home than it is for the the guy that's on deployment think about whenever you've got a missing kid and what is it that the parent or, or missing anybody right when the family of that person are doing the press tour uh, trying to appeal the thing that they all say even if it's been 5 years i just want to know mm. because the open loop yeah of being uncertain about something is literal torture and yeah i can imagine that by not knowing it's not like your whatsapp messaging every couple of hours yeah good just got to ramadi bit hot here uh his selfie like that's not that's not the way that it works no nope. no nope. so they don't know what's going on and fear of the unknown is a thing and so for the families back home it can be very very difficult for sure would you ever run for office does that call to you at all i i certainly hope not <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't I don't want to get involved in politics and you know, I don't think it's just, it's just just a disgusting sort of life and you know, my I have friends that are involved in politics and it just doesn't seem like that uh doesn't seem like what I'd want, I'd want to do um in my life. What about running a school? Obviously you've got the stuff that you already do with kids. Yep. You have that that foot in the door. Tim has got his thing up yep. in Austin. Yep. Does that call to you? Yeah, and I've I've got people that are, you know, again Tim and I talked about this and Tim's doing an awesome thing with his school Apogee Cedar Park. So and look at it, it's, it's outstanding. So with the warrior kid thing, I've got some uh, some irons in the fire on that right now. What would you add into, or what would be the, uh, are there any big differences that you think would be made in a school syllabus typical to what you're aware of at the moment if, if you were to be the person that was <laughs> oh, yeah. in charge? Yeah, 100%, of course. Changes to the civilian school yeah. syllabus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like absolutely. What? what would you change? Uh, basic survival skills, right? How to start a fire, how to put out a fire, basic basic trauma medicine, how you do first aid, just those kind of things, how you change the tire on a car, basic plumbing, basic electrical, like some life skills that are very beneficial, working on engines, those kind of things. And eh, those, those are things I would add to the curriculum. Obviously, jujitsu would be in the curriculum. I was going to say, if you were to do that, I would be so interested if, if everybody was, if PE I don't know what you call it out here. Yeah, There's we call it PE. Yep. Uh, if PE was um, heavily pushed toward learning combat and learning martial arts, I would be fascinated to know what happens to bullying rights in schools. Yeah. Oh, if I've, everybody knows that everybody can go. Yeah. Well, there's also, there's a natural pecking order that gets established and it is what it is. The thing is, I've, I've said this, jujitsu will not only help you from get 
Getting bullied, it will also prevent you from becoming a bully. Because when a kid's doing jujitsu, they realize, oh, I'm a little bit bigger and stronger. I can take this person, but there's someone that's bigger and stronger than me and they can take me. And so it, it helps on both, both fronts. What about um, working on movies? Obviously, we've had Cowboy Cerrone, Gina Carano. They're people that have moved across into the movie industry. Would you be interested in that as a, a, a writer or maybe even as a, as a person in front of the lens? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got some, some forward motion on both Warrior Kid right now and on the novel that I wrote called Final Spin. So the, both of those are, being, are moving forward in the, in the movie arena. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and those, those are, it's take Warrior Kid. It's, it's taken a while to find the right people, but that, that's that's moving forward. And same Final Spin took less. I mean, Final Spin only just came out, and it was almost immediately was getting requests for a movie adaptation. Warrior Kid was the same thing, but it took a while to find the right people, and it's a project that I didn't want to kind of just haphazardly throw out there to the world. So yeah, both of those are moving forward in the. And and they're gonna come. How does that feel as someone who didn't grow up with, I don't know, a, a desire to be a writer uh, throughout seals, throughout Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and surfing and stuff like that, and then you just a, a, appear with a, a fiction novel, and now it's being turned into a film. What, what, how does that feel? What does that mean to you? I mean, I have so many stories in my head that's kind of crazy. That's the one that bubbled to the surface, and there's a bunch more that come up on a daily basis that it's just a matter of which ones I'm going to take the time to put onto paper. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't think about that kind of stuff too much. Um, I'm stoked. You know, it's very cool. Um, it's it's cool. I like it. It's 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 going to be cool to watch this thing get made, and I'm stoked about it. That is a byproduct. The fact that you don't overthink, um, you don't think too much about the situation itself, I think is a byproduct of someone that has a lot of forward momentum. I think that when you've just got lots of things that are happening, um, you by necessity you just focus on whatever's next in front of you. Yeah. Earlier you were talking about thinking about whether you're going to be successful or not. And I, oddly enough, I don't really, I don't really think about that. I don't think about how's this book going to do? How's this, is it going to get turned into a movie? I don't think about that. I just kind of go. And I, so I guess, yes, I agree with you. You're the forward momentum piece. I'm kind of moving forward and, and people that work with me, they know that I'm like on to the next thing. All right. Hey, cool. That thing's, that thing's got some trajectory. It's going in the right direction. Cool. I'm going to go on to the next thing and, and keep moving forward. I spoke to Huberman a couple of weeks ago uh, and I brought up with him about the fact that um, he's got tattoos that very few people have, have seen, although there are photos on the internet. It's one of him in an uh, octopus t-shirt looking like this. Um, have you got any tattoos? Yeah. I'm thinking that you've got one. What, what is it? What does it mean? I, I, I got a tattoo when I was a kid. Like, you know, I was in the hardcore scene and, and you know, we all we're getting tattoos and and so yeah i got a tattoo it's like a, just a kind of a random design on my back uh no real it's kind of half finished and it's kind of dumb but <laughs> would you ever finish it off or are you just i don't care not bothered no. now? well i guess it yeah. is literally behind you yeah yeah it's literally behind me and i think one of my daughters said you should get that thing finished i'm like yeah i'm, I'm not gonna miss <laughs> i'm not gonna miss three days of jujitsu to let a tattoo heal up so that is it's not happening so I know that you're a fan of the uh, Thomas Sowell quote where he says, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. And this is something in a roundabout way, that same concept is probably one of the most meaningful things that I've learned this year. How, what does that quote mean to you? Or how have you, how have you um, reflected on that? And well, especially from a leadership perspective, that's kind of where I talked about it for the first time. How the heck did you hear that quote from me? That's, I don't know when I've said that. I guess I could did some podcasts about it, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's very helpful to people's mindsets, I think. And that's when I, when I talked about that, it was primarily to help people see that you're looking for a full on solution to this problem. And there's probably not a full on solution that's going to satisfy every, every aspect of this scenario. 
So what you have to do instead is you have to look for what, what's the trade-off going to be. I'm going to win a little bit here. I'm going to lose a little bit there. But overall, it's going to move me in the right direction. I think it's a good thing to understand as opposed to going through life thinking that you're going to find a 100% solution because it's not going to exist. So you're going to have to make trade-offs in life. Douglas Murray came on the show and he was talking about this uh, story from Christopher Hitchens where uh, Hitch told him that in life we have to choose our regrets. And what he meant by that was the fact that opportunity cost demands that you're going to have regrets. And I'd always thought that regrets were a uh, bug, not a feature of life. I didn't realize that they were baked into the literal fabric of how we exist. So you could make the perfect decision yep, and still look back and have regrets about not making the other one simply because of that open loop that we were talking about before. Yep. You don't know what the other thing could have been. I was like, okay, so, well, that's interesting that re regrets are a, a feature, not a bug. But what does it mean that you need to choose them? Okay, well, given the fact that regrets are baked into the fabric of life, when you're making a decision, one of the things that you need to consider is which of these regrets can I live with and which of these regrets can I not live with? And that there's no solutions, only trade-offs thing speaks to the same energy. 100%. You, do you own a house? Yes. So when you're, the, a real estate agent told me this years and years ago. When you're looking at a house, there's going to be shortfalls. There's going to be problems with the house that you're looking at. And whether it's going to be, even if it's the perfect house, well, that means it's going to cost a ton. So that's the trade-off that you're going to make. And so what you have to do is you have to break down like what you just said. Hey, listen, I wanted a bigger yard, but this one has a huge garage. I'm going to go with it. You just got to figure out those trade-offs. There's no solutions. You're not going to get the perfect house until you build one. And even when we build one, guess what? You're going to look at it when you're done and you're going to say, I should have moved this wall. 24 inches to the west <laughs> <laughs> right it's it, it'll it'll eat you up talk to me about your uh approach with long-term plans because i've heard you mention that uh real long-term plans are something that you don't necessarily optimize for you seem to optimize a little bit more for optionality and for kind of a medium term thing. What's, what's your thinking around that? Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five years. People are like, what, what do you, what, what's your five-year plan? I have no idea what my five-year plan is because I don't know what opportunities are going to arise. I don't know what things I'm going to fail at. I don't know what mistakes I'm going to make. So where, how am I going to sit here and tell you where I'm going to be in five years? I, I can't. And if I did, I'd probably be shutting off some opportunities that are there because I'm too close-minded and focused on some five-year plan. So I make iterative decisions about things. I move a little bit in some direction. I test, I get the feedback from it. Was it good? Was it bad? Should I put more resources toward it or not? And then as time goes by, I've either moved significantly in that direction or I've realized it's a dead end and I'm going to move away. It was, it was more convenient a year ago when I'd say five years ago, I didn't have a podcast. I didn't have a book. I didn't have any, I wasn't, didn't have anything really. Yes. That was five years ago. So my five-year plan, if you would have, six years ago, my five-year plan would have been like, oh, I guess I'll be training jujitsu, and I would be training jujitsu and surfing and hanging out with my family. Working with life, probably doing echelon front, but mm -hmm. maybe a slightly bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. We, 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 we didn't jump in and invest some huge amount of money in echelon front. No, we started, hey, does anyone want to learn this stuff? Oh, yeah, it looks like they do. Oh, yeah, it looks like a lot of people do. Oh, it looks like it's very beneficial to them. Oh, they're telling all their friends at other companies that they should do this stuff so they can get better. And that whole way down the path, yes, we'll spend more time. We'll invest more into it. We'll write a book about it. Cool. That made sense. So that's what, that's what I have to take the, the, the approach with everything. What opportunities are going to knock on my door today? What opportunities have I started that are going to close tomorrow? I don't know. So I don't spend, a, I don't invest a lot of time and energy trying to predict where I'm going to be in five years when I don't know. <laughs> I, I really resonated with that. I really like it because especially in the online productivity world, you know, you should break down the 25 year plan into f five year blocks, into one year sprints, into quarterly goals or whatever. <laughs> and it's just never resonated with me. It's never resonated. It doesn't appeal to my nature. It doesn't appeal to the way that life is by design unpredictable and you don't know what skills you're going to acquire, what setbacks or advantages are going to come your way. 
And that was, you, it was, you're one of the first people I've heard who's really succinctly put it together is, look, I don't have, and you're someone that if people were to think Jocko's the kind of guy with a plan, right? You don't go into battle without a plan. You go, well, yeah, but the entire war is something that requires us to respond as it occurs. Yeah. Look at the mistakes we've made, uh, well, America has made as a country in war. Why? Because we had a long-term strategy that didn't make sense. And guess what? No one was willing to say, hey, this long-term strategy we've got is not working. We need to make some adjustments and we need to do it now. Instead, nope. Ignore those numbers. Ignore the, the feedback loop that we're getting. Just press forward with this strategy that we're on. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So I, I don't want to have, you have to go into battle with an idea of where you want to get to. And then you, as you start moving in that direction, you've got to say, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be. We need to make some adjustments. That's the uh, discipline and creativity spectrum coming up again. It is indeed. Looking from the outside as somebody that's black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the stuff that you're doing with Origin, bringing manufacturing back to the US, writing books, books being turned into uh, screenplays and, and movies and stuff like that, and er everything else that you do, that from the outside can look like something which is... Uh, incredibly desirable as a position to get in. One thing that I've learned over the last few years, especially since spending more time around the people that are successful and have accolades and stuff, is that often there's prices that they pay for getting to this stage that they're at, that the people who want to be there wouldn't end up paying. So um, what I've come to believe is that a lot of the time people have very, very uh, high bars and challenges that they need to get past. I'm interested in what the, the price is that you have to pay in order to sort of be Jocko Willink on a daily basis. Work. Work. A lot of work. You know, when, uh, when you're watching TV or you're, you know, looking at Instagram or you're, you know, going out for dinner on a date and you go to a movie, I'm not doing that. I'm reading a book. I'm getting ready for a podcast. I'm writing something. I'm preparing for something. I'm talking to a client. I'm designing something. I'm thinking about a new supplement. Like it's just, just it's 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 just kind of all the time and so this, a guy asked me the other day are you working more now than you were when you were in the seal teams and the answer is 100 percent. yes i'm working harder now you know i'm well i should say i'm working more because i'm working more Different. more time no no weekends um no weekends no evenings really luckily for me I like what I do. I was going to say, so would you even want that? You know, would you want to spend an afternoon on the couch watching Netflix? Is that something after a very long time of, of driving discipline? Mm. Is that a desire that you have any longer? To sit on the couch and watch Netflix? Yeah. I mean, not, not, that's not, that's not super, I'm not super stoked on that. Yeah, that's my point. Uh, yeah. You've so. managed to align what you want and what you want to want, they're now sitting on top of each other, right? Yeah, and I, I also don't do a lot of what I don't want to do. And my partner at Echelon Front, Leif Babin, pointed this out to me like a year ago. He just said, he said, you know, you've always, you're really good. He was doing some stuff that he didn't want to be doing. And, you know, whether it was administrative stuff and, you know, he said, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to do this. I said, why are you doing that? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, get someone else to do that. And then, you know, a week later he's talking, he goes, you know, I was thinking about what you said. You're really good at not doing what you don't want to do. And I am good at doing, I'm, I am good at not doing what I don't want to do. I mean, administrative stuff, stuff like that. I don't do any of it. I don't do any of it. Do I have an accountant? Does an accountant cost me a lot of money? Yes, they do. Do I worry about it? Nope. Not in a single bit, not in the slightest way. I don't worry about it at all. And I don't have to deal with it. And my taxes are getting done. You know, it, that's, a, that's a crazy amount of work and effort. I don't do any of it. Logistics for 
my online store. Do I do that? I don't do any of that. I don't do any of that. I don't touch that stuff. So all the stuff that what I get to do what I like to do. The weird thing is it is a lot and, and, and mo- it's, it's going to be, it's, it's challenging for people to do. It's challenging for people to do. It's challenging. It's challenging. You know, uh, you know, my wife, she's like, e-, you know, I said, well, that's not, I, I said, you know, she'll say like, well, what about, what about this? And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that. And she says, you're not normal. You know? And I said, okay, fair enough. She doesn't think I'm, she doesn't think I'm normal. And I think she's probably right. <laughs> I fear she may be right as well. Yeah. I, so what's the principle there that, that people could take away? Is it to try and outsource the things that you don't want to do? Especially let's say that it's someone that's growing a business or that is um, beginning to get themselves to the stage where they have the resources to be able to do this as quickly as possible give away the things that you don't like to do to people who can do them yeah and and there's certain things that only you can do yes do you do those things yes and let other people do things that other people can do and 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 look i'm i'm also you know if you want to get straight business business tactical i tell people all the time you know you you keep things small and you let the demand signal increase and you grow as the demand signal increases and as opposed to what I'm not I, I don't jump in and say oh I don't like doing paperwork and I've got a business that I've had for three months and so I'm gonna hire someone as a as a <coughs> CFO to run my accounting right now no I'm doing that stuff I'm doing that stuff until we have enough income to comfortably say yeah we can get someone else to do this now and I can then focus on what I'm good at so I've done that with all my businesses start small and grow as the demand signal is there grow and, and you know I've done things that w- did, didn't work and luckily I didn't invest a bunch of time and effort into them because hey I'm I'm gonna be wrong a lot and so just because I think something is cool doesn't mean other people are gonna think it's cool I happen to like some random thing and some people might not or a lot of people might not like it so I'm not gonna overly invest in something that I, that people might not want at all Thinking about uh, the stuff that you can afford to outsource and the things that you can't, I think a good heuristic is what you just said there. So what are the things that only you can do? Yep. Only you can do your podcast. Only I can do my podcast. Precisely. Yeah. Only you can write your book, books, yep. etc. Uh, another one that I learned the other day from Layla Hormozy is a lot of the time, let's say that someone's got a, a company, a sales company selling software or IT or whatever. One of the first people that they'll bring on is a salesperson and then they'll begin to do operations and she said, well, hang on, that's the thing that brings the money in. That's the thing that gives fuel to the engine, which you're hoping will drive everything else. So I do think that there's another element that I learned from her, which is do not outsource the thing that drives the revenue. The thing that drives the revenue must be protected at all costs. And if that thing is you, and another element that links back to what you just said there, if that thing is your motivation, how can we protect the motivation? Well, my motivation is waning to do the thing, to write the book, to do the podcast, to, to give the speeches, whatever, because of the amount of administration. Okay, let's lean into that even more. There's, that's the point of highest uh, leverage for us. Yep. Get that blockage out of the way. Yep. Yeah, and I have all kinds of people that do all the stuff that I'm either A, not good at, or B, don't want to do, which is beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful thing. That's decentralized command. It's the fourth law of combat leadership. You know, like, hey, how, how, what's going on in, we have five factories right now at Origin USA, right? Where that's are they? Three in Maine, two in North Carolina. So that's an incredible amount of logistics and, and I mean, just leadership that's going on inside those. And the technical aspect of weaving cloth and sewing and setting up lines for production. That's incredible amount of work and effort and knowledge that I don't have any expertise in whatsoever. Guess what? I have a team that does. I have people that are awesome. And so that's what's going on. Echelon Front, we have scores of clients and they need help in leadership. I can't teach them all. Guess what? I have a whole team of people that has their own experiences and they're out there every single day teaching clients the, the leadership lessons that we know. 
Jocko Fuel, the same thing. You were asking me earlier, like what goes into making these things? Oh, am I giving strategic guidance about what I want? A hundred percent. Am I taste sampling? Which by the way, there's a good example of something that didn't work. You know, the first, we, we made an energy drink. The first version of the energy drink was based on my taste buds. Well, my taste buds, since I don't drink a lot of sweets, the first version that we made was not very sweet at all. To me, it tasted like maple syrup practically. But we, I had to open my mind and get feedback. And people were like, no, actually, this doesn't taste good. Okay, well, then let's change it. We just changed, all, we just changed every single flavor starting now. But that took, that took trial and error of me saying, wait a second, I love the way this tastes, but seven out of 10 people would say, yeah, it's okay. Three out of 10 people would say, this doesn't taste good at all. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a success. You got to have 10 out of 10 people say, this freaking tastes delicious. And look, you got different flavors and maybe nine out of 10 love all the flavors and there's one that, oh, they don't like this one. But I've got to take that feedback and, and adjust to what I'm hearing. But that's an example of, hey, we went down this road of this certain flavor and a flavor system that was based on my taste, which is why I, I, I know that I have to open my mind and take other opinions and listen to what other people have to say. And now we've got taste that, are, are delicious and universally delicious. And so now we can kind of go hard and getting it out there because before there's a risk of, hey, if how many times are you gonna get someone to try a drink? One time. If it tastes like junk, they're not getting it again. So now we've got tastes that are delicious and now people, yep, try it. Now, we're, now we can win on taste, which is awesome. We're already winning on efficacy and, and health, but you gotta, you gotta win on all fronts. So now we can win on taste too. What's coming up next? What have you got for the rest of the year that's coming up that you're excited about or interested in? Probably one of the biggest things is we've got a, a hunt line coming out from Origin. So we're making a, f a full line of hunting clothing, hunting apparel from the base layer all the way out to the out outer jacket. So that's been a huge undertaking and it's very aggressive. It was very aggressive. What do you mean? Trying to get that done in a short period of time was very aggressive. And the reason we're able to do it is because everything's in America. The reason we're able to do it is because we're able to literally make, an, a, make a design change and have it 15 minutes later for testing. You can't do that when you're working with an overseas company. It's, it's impossible. It's at a minimum, if you're flying it, it's going to take three, four days, four or five days to get back. It's got to get in line. You, you don't control the line. It's, it's a travesty. But we were able to, because we're all manufactured here and, and the material that we're using is from here. So we don't even have to wait for some material to ship from overseas. Everything is 100% American made. So that was a, a huge undertaking. We're starting to get to that point where I think I'm getting my first uh, set of the kit here in another week, and then it'll be going into production. So that's pretty cool. You know, we have a, a, an online training academy. So the, the leadership thing, again, you know, we talked about leadership being a skill. Just like you can't go to the gym in one time and get in shape, or you can't train jujitsu one time and now you can defend yourself, or you can't pick up a guitar one time, it's the same thing with leadership. You can't just sit through one seminar or read one book and go, okay, cool. I've got, it. I mean, imagine if you picked up a book on guitar and you read it and now you thought you were going to be able to play guitar or you read a book about basketball. And now look, you would get the concepts down. You would understand what you're going to be working to toward, but it's a legitimate skill that you have to employ in scenarios to get better at. And so in order to in order to make that happen, and it was, again, a little bit of a blessing from COVID, we had created an online platform for a client that had 157,000 employees worldwide, and they wanted us to train all their employees. And so I said, hold on a minute, because <laughs> that would have basically been the dedication of the entire team at Echelon Front to make that happen, traveling. And so we had created, before COVID, we had created an online training platform. And then as that, as COVID hit, we immediately said, okay, looks like we're doing this stuff virtually. And what was beautiful was the entire world was, was made to do virtual interaction, whether it was talking. I knew in Easter, I had whatever Easter dinner 
with my parents via a Skype call or a Zoom call or whatever. And I said, yep, this is the, this is the norm now. Everyone's going to understand the capability, the, the benefits of being able to utilize video interaction. Because before that, before COVID, it was, it was rare. I mean, how many video calls did you do before COVID? Apart from for the podcast, it was my input from that. Uh, up until COVID, video podcasting was seen as a second rate thing to do. Right. And I, don't get me wrong. I would much rather sit down. But especially as a fledgling creator coming up, I didn't have Joe Rogan money, right? right. So I couldn't have a nice studio or fly guests out or do whatever. Um, so for me, that was how I was competing. Then everybody had to do yep. it. Yep. You, you, you want to keep your show going? You want to keep publishing? It completely flattened the field. Right. right. Which meant that what are we competing on now? Oh, well, we're competing on the quality of the conversation. We're not competing on how fancy the studio is. Yep. Well, that's interesting. And so as that happened to you and as it happened to every family in America that suddenly realized they were going to utilize and they understood the technology now because there's a technology barrier. So now at Echelon Front, we said, okay, great. Now we can, now we can train people on a much more regular basis. We can offer them. So, so we made extremeownership.com, which is an online training platform for leadership and for life. Because if you're- So that's not just for corporate. That's also people can go do that yep, themselves. It's, it's individuals. And it's individuals. This is the thing that- you know, part of the thing that people people need to understand is if you're a human and you interact with other human beings, you're in a leadership position. It doesn't matter if you're the if you're a, a frontline worker and you're not in charge of any other people. But guess what? You're interacting with your peers. You're interacting, and you have to lead your boss. You have to be able to lead your boss. Your boss doesn't know what's happening in the field. Your boss doesn't know what time that concrete should be poured. Your boss doesn't know what what time uh, those those that those forms need to be set up by, doesn't know that. You have to lead your boss in that right direction. You have to lead your peers in the right direction. You have to lead your family in the right direction. You have to, even if you're, you, you, by leading your family, that means putting your ego in check and listening to what your kids have to say. So there's, everybody's a leader. And once people understand that, there's so much they can get out of actually learning leadership skills. So that's been, that's been pretty cool on the Echelon Front side. So that's the origin side. That's the Echelon Front side. The Jocko Fuel side, again, we, we rearranged these flavors. We've, so that's been huge. And, and the rest of the supplement line is just, it's just making high quality stuff and not cutting corners. And we're, we're, look, in the beginning when you're doing that, it's hard, right? Because you think, well, wouldn't it be just easier if we did this? Wouldn't it be, couldn't we just cut this? Couldn't we use a little less of this, this uh, protein that's more expensive? This expensive type of sweetener right. or whatever. Yeah. And, and so you want to make those cuts early on, and we didn't. And, and look, quite frankly, when my name is on the freaking label, I, I can't. I can't just cut corners. But now people recognize that. They recognize that when they buy something from Jocko Fuel, it's as good as it's as good as you can get. It's the best quality stuff that you can get. So that's starting to starting to take hold. And so that's been that's been great to see as well. Jocko Welling, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with the stuff that you're doing, where should they go? Jocko.com. Jocko, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.